You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Well, I was right to court and then came back up and went and got the 12 months Young Offenders Institution and next door to the detention centre in Glenorchal. Mm-hmm. And uh, that sure I met a whole load of crazy fuckers. One in uh, particular that stands out was James O'Neill, uh, Neely. Uh, his full title was Neely the Bomb. He was always making fucking improvised explosive devices with matches and gas canisters. And, and my job was then to phone the newspapers to tell them the demands. So I'm waiting in the queue to phone the newspapers and I uh, heard a scream going up. And Jock Donaldson standing at the top of the fucking stairs with a blade that screws his neck. He says, I used the sauce for it. I'll put black tape on it, held it upside down like a grenade. I don't know if, if it's a one-off, but I don't know many airplanes or anybody that's fucking put black tape on it. So you it looked like one of the gra- German grenades. Ah, that's what he's done it with. And he pulled me aside and gave me some tobacco and said, you have to go in the exercise yard tomorrow. Right, yeah. Who, to see who? Uh, the IRA. And in Charlie Bronson's mind, that's because he's hijacked an airplane it would then follow that he can fly an heli- a helicopter. Doesn't he work like that? Two different separate things. So he told him if he didn't get the cheeseburgers, he was going to start eating the hostages. <laughs> <laughs> Mad. And a lot of people turn around and, and think, oh, that's a glamorous life, is it? You you sit in, doesn't matter what prison you're in or you're getting a visit. The minute your family walk up, sit up for that table at the end of the visit and walk away, you're fucked. Boom, we're on. Good, James. And we've got the guest that everybody's wanted back, Mr. Paul Ferris. Thanks, James. How are you? I'm fine, yourself? Really good, mate. Really good. 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 Crack and gaff. Nice. Love nice, it. Nice country feel, huh? Yeah, love it. Our last podcast is nearly at a million views. Two scheme boys talking. It's mega. Everybody's wanted you back. I think a lot of people understand your background. You've wrote countless books. Got a film out there about you. You know you've been bullied, you got revenge, involved in one of the biggest unsolved murders in Scottish history. But now here you are. Again, part two. We don't we've no spoke how we're gonna take this conversation either, but we're just gonna take it on our journey. But I'd like to touch on all the prisons you've been in. Yep. You've been in ten different prisons. Yep. No doubt you've met a lot of fascinating characters. <laughs> just a touch. You've spent over fifteen years in a jail. So I want to go right back to the first jail you were in and why. Uh, the first one was uh, Berlini as a young offender. Uh, it was one of these situations in Black Hill. The older boys was nicking the cars, uh, taking a chase, and then abandoning them. So we get settings on the car. On this occasion, I didn't go to drive. I couldn't even drive. I just happened to jump in the, the driver's seat. Cops are uh, nicked. So I get charged for car theft. And when I explained to the solicitor, who was a court appointed solicitor at the time, uh, Peter Forbes uh, he asked me the whole story about it and when I've told him that I never stole the car told him the circumstances he said oh you plead not guilty to this and as i done that I get remanded uh, took to Berlin went into D Hall top flat where they kept the young offenders and I remember looking out the window because you had to go and stand on the or, or somebody to help you up mm-hmm. and I could see parts of Black Hill and I was fucking devastated thinking how did I end up in here? Mm-hmm. Uh, I was in there for two or three days until they move you. They, they come down and collect you and then take you up me longer again. But during the, the process of the, being on remand and the uh, Berlin young offenders at that stage, there was somebody else in there, a young offender, that was going to trial. I think it was to do with a death. He was up for killing his boyfriend, or the girlfriend's uh, the boyfriend, that two of them were seeing each other. I never knew the circumstances. It was just <clears throat> somebody came to the door, the prison door, and asked for some tobacco. But it was it was no a polite request. It was like you got fucking tobacco in there. So I fucked him off anyway. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'd enough with the kind of the bullying in that stage. So no, it's no happening in prison. So the guy who was in me, he came from Black Hill as well, and he said, "Watch him. He's liable to come in in the morning. Have this." 
I got a tooth a toothbrush with a couple of razor blades melted into it. And I had it under my pillow in my bunk. And sure enough, next morning, this guy came in and it turns out he was a fucking amateur boxer. <laughs> 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 amateur boxer. And I'm laughing because I got three rapid and I never knew it. <laughs> boom, boom, boom. <laughs> and then I'm ended up in the bottom bunk and uh, just remembered, fuck, I've got this, which was an equaliser. Uh, so we get badly cut and flung out the door and the, the alarm went off because I never knew he was at trial. So he went to trial with quite a lot of damage on him. Uh, and everybody else got moved to Long again, and I get kept there for the investigation. And they thought I was involved in a love triangle. I never knew the guy, never knew what he was up for. Uh, so when I ended up going to Long again, which is the second one, uh, they came down on the bus to pick you up for Berlini. And I knew something was wrong. I'd never been in Long again before, but I get put right into a place called the Dog Leg. And they call it a Dog Leg because it's that's the army type thing. It was all ex-military screws that run it. Uh, so at very early age, I get put into uh, the dog leg as a potential troublemaker. And then for uh, the dog leg, you used to get down to the dining hall, uh, get your food. And that's where I met Paul Hanlon for the first time, Joe Hanlon's brother. And there was a, a revenge thing going on with some other prisoners that were in there. And it all kicked off, and I'm standing there with a steel tray. And uh, somebody's had a goat bag fall. So I threw the steel tray to hit this guy. And it drifted off like a fucking boomerang. <laughs> Hot screw right in the side of the head. <laughs> and I thought I'd get away with it until the cook, who was also a screw, was behind the servery. He looked at me and said, you, I've fucking seen that. And uh, I've had a few kickings in my time, but this was just something special. What age were you, Paul? But that, uh, 17, 16, 17. Did that make you hate the authorities? No, I just, I, I just saw it. I shouldn't have thrown it through the tray. Mm -hmm. But what had happened was, <clears throat> when it kicks off like that, all the screws run in because the right bell goes off. So you've got a screw holding one arm, another screw holding another arm, and then you're elevated. One's got your leg, the other one's got your leg. And I, rem I remember hearing something and then, a massive pain. He couldn't see nothing. You're, as though you're floating in air. Your face is done in the, about three feet off the ground. And this other screw ran right up behind me and kicked me right in the bollocks, a, 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 like a penalty kick. And I, I remember something going off in my head with this fucking pain. I uh, can't remember too much after it, but it was a fucking sore one. And so that just put us into us and them scenario. Mm -hmm. That they were grown men bashing young boys like that, mm -hmm. but. I suppose you, you get involved in things, you go to fucking take it as, yeah, as it goes. Yeah, you haven't learned, mate, as, but you never learned your lesson until later on <laughs> uh, in life. No, no, I was a slow start there, but, <laughs> but uh, it's something like that you always remember. You can remember that pain, uh -huh. so. And you went to Glen Oco after long again? No, I, I ended up uh, getting a social inquiry report. Dredge Mackay, he was the senior social worker mm -hmm. for Black Hill and that surrounding area. Mm -hmm. And I think because he my honesty and told him look, somebody else nicked the car and we were there and we were getting seconds on the car. So technically I never stole it, but you still get chance for a car theft. Aye. So whatever report he put in, it worked because I, I got admonished mm -hmm. uh, until I get nicked again. Who um, was your lawyer? Uh, Peter Forbes. Was he all right? He was a court-appointed solicitor. And I, I had no need for a solicitor at the time. My dad, he was in uh, prison for, for bank robbery at the time. So mm -hmm. I, I never had any male members of the family or, or uncles to tell me, this is the family solicitor or whatever. You know, mm -hmm. it's a court appointed solicitor and I kept with Peter Forbes right through it. Mm -hmm. So you done a year in Glen Oco after that? What was that for? Uh, I'd done a year in Glen Oco. I first the first sentence I went to Glen Oco was That was in eighty one. Was for a, an assault and robbery, uh, with Jill Redman, another local guy for Black Hill. And it was an, a, 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 an assault and robbery in Erdry where a night safe bag was to get deposited and a night safe and uh, we took it before they could put it in but unfortunately where we were running we never knew the whole area I was running towards Erdre police station and I get bundled to the ground like a rugby tackle uh, but you fast? and walked a hundred yards into the cops were you fast? Was I thought I was fast <laughs> I, but I wasn't that fucking fast <laughs> right, and it turns out that this guy had I don't know how fast he was but he was in a rugby team and <laughs> all I remember was getting bundled to the ground so we get nicked for that and uh, 
I, I ended up getting sent to uh, Glen Oakle for the short, sharp shock. Mm-hmm. And it was a fucking short, sharp shock. So what is that for people who don't know? Uh, it's a military type regime. Uh, you're not allowed to talk until you're spoken to. Uh, loads of discipline. And f- for me, what I can remember is it's like being a young guy with blinkers on until you end up in somewhere like that and your blinkers are off and you just need to get, get your head done and get on with it. But it was hard, James, because there's a funny part of it when we were all held in the cell at the Sheriff Court, Glasgow Sheriff Court, and uh, it became apparent that everybody in the cell was going to the detention centre. And we were all running about the same age, but there was this one guy with a moustache that we we thought, oh, he's a man. Is, what's he doing in here? Mm-hmm. Turns out he was under 21. He's going to detention centre. So he took the lead in the, the, the cell, by saying, we're all going to this detention centre. We've all heard about it. And I never really heard about it. I'm listening to him. He's the mm-hmm. gang fucking leader, isn't he? The guy with the moustache, the big man. And no, he's instructing us all. Nobody march. It's only for three months and we'll spend our time in the segregation unit and fuck the marching and we're doing nothing. We're rebels and we're all going, yeah. <laughs> so mm. uh, that only, that took place until the cell door opened and then you get a prison officer with, with a list of names and you get called up. And luckily for me, I was called out quite quickly, but I was handcuffed to two different people, which meant I sit at the back of the bus. So as they fill up the bus, <laughs> the the gang leader with a moustache, I don't even know his name, uh, he's kind of halfway down the bus, or near the front of the bus. And it's all that dreaded journey on a single-decker bus, because I used to gun them with my dad. My dad owned two buses, so I was familiar with... with, with. Mm-hmm. But I had, the, I had the bird's eye view. I'm sitting at the back seat. And then we... It just dawns on you when the gates open, you think, oh, fucking hell, what is this? Are you worried or anything? I'm not so much worried, I'm probably apprehensive for the unknown, because mm-hmm. you don't know, you hear all these stories about fucking what goes on, and whatever you hear about what goes on, it's actually worse than uh, when it happens. <laughs> so the the bus pulls in, and all you hear, and nobody talks, it's just mm-hmm. shouting and bawling, right, fucking listen for your name, and so everybody all sat and quiet. And within the first three or four names, big Johnny Bravo with a moustache, he's called off the bus, Right, March. Refused to march. Cut of slaps and he was he was marching, but he wasn't march. He was trying to march. Mm-hmm. Kicked up the arse right into reception. So that was a kind of thing for us to go, oh, the leaders marching. So mm-hmm. next 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 name they shouted, stuff fucking off mm-hmm. the bus. And I remember the first time because I was hungry, uh, and in the detention centre there was loads of food, chips, and different things like that. And I remember sitting at the table making a a sandwich with chips never even get a bite out of it just about to eat eat this sandwich and there was a big Aberdonian screw slapped it right out my hand and screaming at me there'll be no chip butties here laddie get up drag me up like that so he sat down in the chair feet together ankles together knife and fork half the chip take half the chip and then a slice of part of the bread that's how you've eaten in here and I thought fucking hell man where have I just landed so what does that date the wales is that trying to discipline them ah it's discipline what, the whole the whole element here, it was actually a uh, a programme uh, for they were downgrading the borstals the borstal was 18 months the discipline was too long so what they what they called it was a short sharp shock was to frighten the life out of uh, people who were coming in on the hope that they're not going to commit any more offences. Mm-hmm. But I'd already been frightened as a kid anyway uh, in Black Hill. Uh, so the, the fear element was gone, but I had to understand, what do I do? How do I cope with this fucking new environment? And maybe about six or seven years, we never even had a hair on our face and we had to shave in the morning. And one of the things was, uh, you get a command in the morning, by your doors. So you have to go and stand in the hallway a pair of shorts on, slippers, a towel over your left hand, your plastic mug and your toothpaste and toothbrush mm-hmm. and march single file down into the, what they call the ablutions. I thought, ablutions? What the fuck's ablutions? It's the toilets. But it's all military grade 
Sounds like Lang- fucking dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Aye. So, and I remember this other ginger-headed uh, Irish crew, Northern Irish crew. Uh, uh, and as you go into the, the, the ablutions, the toilets, Razor, so he's getting people Razor, came to me, Razor, and I went, no thanks. Poof, <laughs> slap me in the side of the head. Razor, uh, uh, no thanks, again, you stand there. Somebody else came down, Razor, no thank you, sir. And I thought, all right, that's what you have to say. No, thank you, sir. Mm-hmm. So he's went, Razor. I went, no, thank you, sir. And he's went, you fucking will. <laughs> it was like that Tango advert now, t- t- years ago, uh, somebody yeah, started getting slapped. And it was like multiple, it's like an octopus hitting you. He's mm-hmm. summed out the Matrix, it's that fast. And it's only when I looked in the mirror. I kept the plastic thing on the razor and kidding on I'm shaving, but I've got these big red hand ulsters all over my fucking face mm-hmm. and my body. And I thought, well, I need to pick my gear up for you. I need to, I need to be switched on, I need to mm-hmm. be in tune with all this. So apparently you go through there and then don't you breakfast, and then for breakfast to, to the gymnasium and then the sports uh, field where you've got to try and get a mile on. And uh, I used to run cross country for the school when I was at school. But I'd forgot I'd done a three months remand lying on my fucking bed, didn't I? Mm-hmm. So when I volunteered, I used to do some cross country running. Did you have a tool every jail you were in? A what? Do you always have a tool on you? I uh, know that one. I learned after that one. Mm-hmm. You could any time to get a tool. The only tool was me. I was a fucking tool. Mm-hmm. We were all tools. They had total command. Did they? No conversations with anybody at all. What to- was the what was the Recon- what was the conviction rate of boys reoffending again? Uh, was it high then or was I, it I'm shorter? Not, I'm not too sure. I think it fucking frightened the life out of quite a lot yeah. of them. Do you think it was enough or do you think it made you rebel? No, it's it, something for me. I'd, I'd already been, uh, I was out in bail for a, I don't want bail, I was to get up for another charge for a possession of firearm. So when I get released for the detention centre, I was right to court and then came back up and went and got the 12 months. Young Offenders Institution and next door to the detention centre in Glenoco. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's where I met a whole load of crazy fuckers. Yeah. One in uh, particular that stands out was James O'Neill, uh, Neely. Uh, his full title was Neely the Bomb. He was always making fucking improvised explosive devices with matches and gas canisters. And, but he ran the whole jail. And Where was he for? He was for Balonok. Quite a big family, a couple of brothers, uh, but Neely was the head of what you would call the jail gang. Uh, it was called the Glenoco Wolves, uh, specifically targeted sex offenders because at that time they were, they were uh, mingling, they were in the same association. So in order to get into the Glenoco Wolves, you need, needed to do a, a sex offender, either stab them, slash them, cost them, or scald. Something had to be happen to them before you get in. Uh, Certain people got a pass. I got a pass because uh, I'd already done detention and I was in for a firearm. So it was a big offence mm-hmm. for a, a young offender. And what I remember of it nearly uh, was kind of strange. He, he, he was uh, he was very clever uh, and manipulative because I remember one occasion he said, "Come and see this fool." Uh, he's opened this cell door and he said to this. Obviously, it was a sex offender. I didn't know what he was all about. He said, show Paul what you're going to do tonight. So he stood on the chair. Neely's got the towel. And the window's open it out the way in, in Glenoco. So Neely's put the big knot with the towel on it, uh, put it around the boy's neck, and then said, and now you're going to do this later on? He said, aye. He just kicked the chair away from him, left him dangling. <laughs> I know I'm laughing, I shouldn't have laughed, but maybe I should laugh, it was a nonce anyway. So, <laughs> so nearly shut the door and casually we're going down for our lunch. So we're sitting at the table, the next thing the alarm bell goes, the guy get cut down, but there's be, there was a few so people that talked to cell and, and nearly, uh, God rest him, he's no longer here, nearly was responsible for, there was a, a, a home office inquiry into the fatalities and the attempted suicides. And if they didn't want to hang themselves, nearly used to give them a blade to see how sharp it was. And if you're serious about being wrong about why you molested that kid or whatever it is, shows how good a deep a cut you can do in your wrist and your ankles. Mm-hmm. And they done it. Do you think he killed a few people in there? No, no I, killed them, no, but no, made them no, kill he, themselves? He made them kill themselves, aye, but there's a few that survived. 
So that was my introduction into. So you were seeing deaths and violence. I, I don't think I actually extreme. seen the deaths, James. To be honest with you, in my mind, this mm-hmm. guy's dead. But whether he did or not, I don't know. But there was a few. So he used to get few. the rope, hang them up in a chair. No, the chair no, it was a chill. chill. He split the chill in two with a, a razor blade and then tighten knots, and then made a, a noose out of it. Mm-hmm. But one of the things that he, that he said to us was, and the and the workshop and the textile industry uh, in Glenoco we seen the ginger Irish screw, Northern Irish screw again. And I've looked at him and I thought, you fucker, that was something that slapped me for uh, no taking the razor properly. Totally different attitude than the young offenders. They don't talk like that and we never knew any better. So we decided, I told nearly the, nearly the story and he said, all right, watch us. <laughs> no, I never knew, I was thinking, watch us. I watched him since he kicked the fucking chair away mm-hmm. and left the boy hanging for the... Or the non singing for the, the, the window. And, and long after it, uh, there's a bucket of shit that's going to get put over a screw's head. And, and it did happen. And whoever done it, it was a big eck for Dundee. That was his way into getting into the, the Glenoco Wolves. And I know it's disgusting, and it is really disgusting, but so was the way we were treated. And it was a, it was a thing where nearly went. It's amazing what you can do in here, eh? And I remember the noise of the screw pulling the bucket off. His, it was like... <laughs> <laughs> and he's thrown up and fucking the whole lot of it. Uh, and the smell. Uh, so that that's <laughs> that's what I remember about mm-hmm. This is the environment you, that you're living in. Yeah. And knives going missing for the, the cookhouse. Just devilment every day. Mm-hmm. Hell ho. What was it like being mixed with the, the nonces then? Because obviously now they've got their separate units and separate well, wings. Well, we, we didn't know any so didn't gen- know We didn't know. So it, was just another, it was just another prisoner. Mm-hmm. But what, what tended to happen was you get a couple of decent screws that would mark people's cards and say, watch him, he's a fucking sex offender. And that was Neely's kind of uh, mm-hmm. way of dishing out a bit of punishment. Because he always said, well, the kids couldn't do anything for themselves, so we'll fucking do it. Mm-hmm. And he did, and he didn't mm-hmm. miss them. So you went to Shots Prison in 85 mm-hmm. to 86. What was that charge? Again, that was uh, firearms. I was involved in a situation with a guy called Russell Sturton. Uh, I'd already been fitted up in the past, James, so it was nothing new to hear somebody's going to try and fit me up, but this was totally different. Uh, Russell Sturton was working with STV Studios on a, an expose into uh, the drug squad and how they're trying to get him to manipulate uh, and put drugs into my car. I didn't really believe it all at first until I went down to STV Studios, heard what was going on. And then uh, me and Russell had a meeting in Balonok, uh service station and one of these coppers was off duty. Obviously seen me talking to Russell, waited till he went away and he came over and tapped me in the back and said, I'd like to have a word with you. And I said, I knew his face, but I never recognised him without his hat on. He identified he's a cop, and I thought, what the fuck are you talking to me for? But he's making himself out, watch this guy, he's going to fit you up. So as a cop, tell me what I've already been told by the STV and Russell. So I th- I'm on red alert, James. So I've asked him, I went, look, why are you telling me this? And, and he made an excuse on the basis that he's looking for a shotgun. I'm thinking, I've got a couple of grand in the house, I'm thinking, I'm going to pay him, because I know they're using uh, recording devices for Russell starting, STVs wiring them up, and I thought... I want to get wired out because I need to capture this on tape. They, they can't believe somebody asking you this or, or telling you that somebody else is a, uh, somebody else is uh, going to fight you up. Mm-hmm. So you've got a situation there where uh, it, was, it was quite clear on the, on the basis that I had a couple of grand and I thought I'm going to give him four or five grand uh, to make sure that uh, what he's saying is I can repeat it, I can go and get wired up. But it soon became apparent that the couple of grand was no needed. He was looking for a shotgun. We already had worth a couple anyway, cost a hundred quid each. So I go to a situation where I thought, all right, I can do this. Uh, so I went down to STV Studios, told them what I'm doing. Uh, they didn't want nothing to do with it because it's creating a criminal offence. Me having a shotgun to go in a meeting. It's a bit of a fucking cop and wild up. So they didn't want nothing to do it. So I'd done it myself. So the charge was, uh, during the whole case, uh, in England they've got a, a defence called duress, mm-hmm. or 
uh, agent provocateur in Scotland, I've not got it. You've either got a certificate for a shotgun or you've no. Uh, and I've actually got three years for it. And that's what I went into the prison for, for the three years mm-hmm. for not having a firearm certificate. Was you in YO's still or were you still? No, no, that was me. That was my first uh, ad hoc sentence. What was that like for you? Well, second, that, that, that was strange. Well, you go for the court back to Berlin and then you're waiting to get moved to to Glenoco and I'd already uh, done the Glenoco bit and the wire f- that was actually a, an adult prison at the time as well and when I get moved to Shorts it was a kind of harsh regime but they were building a new a new prison got to, got to meet a lot of new people in there and then the new show prison uh, something happened there was a, uh, another guy called John Gallagher a lifer who was in there they all came down for Peterhead uh, prison to take over the jails, they never go to take over the jails. They were always very wary of the young crews, and we were part of the young crews at the time. And there was another friend of mine, James McLean, who was in there, and James, he challenged them on the exercise yard because somebody broke into the canteen, and one of these do-gooders for Peterhead uh, that came down demanded that we should surrender to the tobacco and the chocolate and get back to the screws, and I went, fuck you. Mm. So they got offered it on the the football pitch. And the strange thing about the football pitch is it was always Celtic supporters versus Rangers supporters. Sometimes the eight aside, sometimes ten aside. But it was you always had spectators out to watch it. On this occasion, because it was a challenge, <laughs> they can't win out. There was forty of us all mm. sitting tooled up to come out, so they never done it. So right away you link up with people for young offenders and there's bonds there that uh, you become part of the prison gang we're all equal and we're who all was there. your closest pal James, the James, th- that stage James McLean McLe- he was in another wing but I got to know uh, Jim Healy who was a younger brother of Mick Healy and there was another guy for Ayrshire Jock Donaldson a lifer uh, and it kicked off one time because John Gallagher got moved or he asked to get moved and uh, Jock Donaldson was one to take a screw hostage uh, to vent the anger about one of the gang being took away. So I got a hold of Jock and I said, "What is it you want to do?" He says, "I'm going to when the screw comes round and asks what you want, how much you want out of your private cash." He said, "I'm just going to drag him in the cell and lock the door." I went, right. So that means he's not involved in anybody else. So my job was to get make sure he's got enough provisions in there. Bread, rolls, sausage, all these sort of things, chocolate. Uh, and my job was then to phone the newspapers to tell them the demands. So I'm waiting in the queue to phone the newspapers and I uh, heard a scream going up. And Jock Donaldson standing at the top of the fucking stairs with a blade at the screw's neck. And five or six guys that I knew well were doing big, big sentences. And what I can remember is maybe a year before it there was a riot in Berlin and there was a guy called Bongo McLeish uh, who was doing six months for shoplifting got himself involved in the riot in Berlin and got himself ten years can sec on top of six months and I'm looking at these guys that are already doing ten years and fifteen years they're going to get a hard time with it so I had to do something and what i done was I knew the screw who got held hostage, Hugh Lees. I knew him for the young offenders. He was never violent. He was just an honest, decent guy doing his job. And uh, I was asked to kind of calm things down a bit. But if you do it without written authority, because he's the only authority person in there, he's the only one that can can say yes or no. So I wrote a note out on the basis that he's asking me to be a neutral body in the negotiations, which means I'm no for it and I'm no against it. And the reason why I've done it is because I knew about the law on mutiny, what happens on the ship. Uh, so you've got a Crown authority, you've got a Crown uh, p- prison officer that's allowing me to speak on behalf of him and the, the, the hostage takers, mm-hmm. which turns out worked in my favour because I ended up going as a witness for all the guys and said I could never have resolved the dispute if it wasn't for them. So I proved that... Although I get the lawful authority to speak, I couldn't have done it without them, so I then gave them lawful authority through that, so they all get found not guilty. Apart from 
Jock Donerson, who played guilty to it anyway. Mm-hmm. So it was a bit of a fucking scary moment. Aye. Aye. What was that like then for at such a young age, Paul, for ages of 20, 21, getting caught with shotguns, guns, doing all your damage then? It's just what, a way what, of life, James. It was something that you didn't know. I'm not saying try to downplay it and say you didn't know any better. Mm-hmm. Of course we knew better, but it was just when you're associating with older people, when I say older people, maybe five years, ten years older mm-hmm. than us, so you get into a, f- a frame of mind where somebody doesn't want to move a shotgun. I was always, I'll do it, I'll do that. Did you like the buzz for it, Paul? I, I liked the fact of being involved with a gang mm-hmm. at the time. I, I just I just liked it. Did you feel protected? No, I just felt as though we're all in the same boat. All bonkers. All bonkers, <laughs> all bonkers, <laughs> all bonkers and... The money was the money was not not so much relevant, but you always got money, James. But mm-hmm. it's just the fact that you're involved with people. That, that's aye. what I liked. You went to a prison called Pentonville. <laughs> what is that? that? Sounds like something in America. Pentonville, aye. aye. What is that? Fucking yeah. Uh, oh, that's is a, a a Victorian English replica. It's probably worse than fucking Bellini, believe mm-hmm. it or not. Uh, I put I get put to Pentonville when I get arrested in 1997, uh, right for court right down to the, the SEG unit in Pentonville because they don't have category of prisoners. I never knew it was on category. Mm-hmm. I just thought any time I get into a prison, it's usually going into the block anyway. So uh, I just never thought anything about it until somebody gave us a newspaper down there. And that first night I'm sitting reading it. I'm lying in my bed and I hear this right on the newspaper and I looked at it. And it was the biggest fucking cockroach you've ever seen. <laughs> like, it's like a big thing like that. And it's staring into my face going, <laughs> so I went, whoa, it's a flick to newspaper. Oh, this thing shot out of the cell. I've jumped up and seen another two. So I've got my boots on and I've surrounded the bed with, with water thinking I've created a moat. I've got a safe haven. Uh, didn't it work? So I've, I've put my trousers in my socks tissues in my fucking ears up my nose and decided I'm having a, I, I'm <laughs> if a screw looked in it they'd be like ah, he's I'm losing have, his shit man I'm having a go with these fuckers right mm. so it was like it's like Danny River does stamp, you, stamp your feet and you've got all these cockroaches right so I kicked, kicked them behind the the, 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 the the cell door and then next morning the governor comes in and sees you because you're on uh, you're in segregation and it He'd say to his morning Ferris, I went, morning governor. Uh, any complaints? I went, yes, two. Two? You're just in this prison. What's the first one? I said, I got porridge this morning and there was sugar in it. He went, uh huh, because you're in England now. You put salt in them in Scotland. I went, yeah. He said, so what's the other one? I said, overcrowding is terrible, governor, in here. Overcrowding? How would you know you're just in the prison? I said, look behind that door. All the cockroaches are all lying oh, there. Indeed. And he laughed and went, you'll no need to worry about that shortly. And I never knew what, what he meant for that. But I did later on, because my dad's cell door can fly out. Right, get yourself ready. I've gone to another prison. Ended up getting took for there. I never even knew where I was going. I just thought, fuck it, what, what other dungeon am I going to? Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a pleasant surprise at a brand new, brand new prison. Belmarsh it was. And I thought, what oh, it's all. It's like a four-star hotel. Fucking nice and clean. No cockroaches. Well, not at that time anyway, mm. but Pentonville was, I'll, I'll not use this term loosely, but it was a fucking shithole. Was but that? Compared to Bellini. And that's saying something, Paul. I know, I know, I know. So you had a break, you had a 10 year period where you never got to jail or never done a sentence. What was your life like then for 85 to 95? Uh, uh, 85, to, uh, no, I, I'd been in, in and out of prison. I never got out of the uh, shorts until 1989, 90. Oh, was it no? Aye. That was for after you're free? Well, the the whole chronology was I get three months detention, mm-hmm. come out of detention and get 12 months. Uh-huh. And then for the 12 months, I got another nine months. Mm-hmm. And then I get an 18 months adult prison sentence. And then I get a three year prison sentence. And then I get out run about 1989, 90. And then, uh, but you had a five year pe- a period where you never got to jail? Aye, for 19, 1990. Oh, well, I was on the man in 1991. <laughs> <90. laughs> so you never had a break. 1992. I'm just talking. 19, no, no, no. It's just, it's just something as, as which 
people, uh-huh. would, people would say, the many kids have you got? And I've, I've got five. And they say, well, why, why the age difference? <laughs> <laughs> that's, my, that's my previous uh, convictions. Aye, aye, aye. You know, so technically, this is the longest I've ever been out since I was a teenager. I've been out 18 well years. Done. Done. Uh, and it's something which it's probably been the hardest thing that mm-hmm. I've done. But uh, if you're going through the chronology of the prison sentence, and mm-hmm. the, then I never really had a break. I was like, this revolving door or the magic elastic band that mm-hmm. you go out and come back in. So a successful criminal doesn't get caught, do they? So, that is a million percent. I, so I'm that, glad that, you say that. And, and a lot of people turn around and, and think, oh, that's a glamorous life, is it? You you sit in, doesn't matter what prison you're in or you're getting a visit, the minute your family walk up, sit up for that table at the end of the visit and walk away, you're fucked. That, that's the one that just, the judge doesn't give you that sentence, you give yourself that sentence. Mm-hmm. And that's what it is. So... Uh, your family goes through it as well. Uh, a lot of people say, well, you should have more thought for what you're doing, and, and that's probably right. But for any uh, the younger audience that, that's watching it or looking towards somebody that's in the jail, always remember this. Visitors walk out, they've got to go back and do their sentence, and it's no nice. Mm-hmm. I've cried a few times, I don't mind admitting that, but you, you, tears dry up. Uh, end up your eyes like sandpaper and <laughs> you get what you got on uh-huh. it. but it's not being hard it's just being accustomed to mm-hmm. uh, no showing emotions because a lot of people especially the screws like to see it mm-hmm. so when you went to Belmarsh what was that like because that's got the reputation totally different about- totally different I've, I've heard the Belmarsh before mm-hmm. uh, and I remember walking down this fucking Glen has got a big corridor they called it the, the Russian front anybody mm-hmm. who's been in there will know because some of them used to have to polish the fucking thing all the way down. But this one was just something else. This was a corridor that took you from one prison mm-hmm. into the bills, into another prison, and down to what you would call H Block 4. And the first time in there, uh, I, I was just glad it was a nice, tidy place. Single cell, uh, sink, toilet. Food was not too bad. Canteen was all right. And I, I, I like to have a puff mm-hmm. <laughs> so I'm thinking was it harsh in? aye, aye a, bit of, a bit of solid or a bit mm-hmm. of black and I'm thinking how do I get a, get a smoke and that preoccupied me how do you get mm-hmm. a smoke and while I get preoccupied there's a Scottish screw that was in there and they obviously look at your prison files and I've always been on the uh, decent jobs in the neck uh, probably you get the jobs to keep the peace and different mm-hmm. things like that but I got offered the laundry job on the wing and I took it and I got introduced to my working partner, a guy called uh, Adnan Horshan. Uh, he was a, an Iraqi, but with dual nationality, with British and uh, Iraqi nationality. And he was in for hijacking a Sudanese Airbus, uh, hijacking it for Sudan, diverting it to Dusseldorf in Germany, and then refueling to Stansted and then sort political asylum and what he'd done it for is he was first he, first a terrorist uh, well he, he charged for terrorism mm-hmm. I fancy he's now thinking he doesn't look like that did he act like that very mild mannered spoken so as I'm getting to know him I get to know his story it turns out he's a West End actor on theatre <laughs> uh, and he, he got money together to go and save his family in Sudan he went over there and paid a few bribes Apparently the family got out and they got stopped at the next checkpoint and then the same thing happened again. So he ran out of money, ran out of patience and I'd asked him, I was curious, I went, how did you hijack the plane? And he, and he, he gave me a story about how Westerners like spicy foods and I'm thinking, right, where the fuck's this conversation about <laughs> spicy foods? And I went, right. And he went, but we, the people that like spicy food, liked brown sauce, HP sauce. Mm. And I'm thinking, <laughs> all right, what next? He says, I used the sauce bottle, put black tape on it, held it upside down like a grenade. That's what he <laughs> And I thought, why did you have HP sauce? Mm-hmm. He went, I like it, but there's a photograph of Big Ben on it. it reminds me of being safe. And I thought, it's a chance he's... Used. I don't know if, if it's a one-off, but I don't know many airplanes or anybody that's fucking put black tape on it. So he hijacked like a one plane of the German sauce grenades. Bottle. Ah, that's what he's done it with. And, I, and then I said to him, why did you do that? He said, the family's going to get killed. And at that time, you need to get back in politics. Saddam Hussein had invaded Kuwait. So he was a bit of a pariah in the newspapers anyway, and the media. 
uh, the whole Western world was against them. So they, Adnan Horshan's defence and the rest of them was uh, to make sure that, that, that they had a de jurés, uh, an English law, that they wouldn't have done that if their life wasn't at risk or their family's life wasn't at risk. So he ran, the, he ran the, a, quite a, a tidy defence and they won his case. And anybody that's looking to, to, to fact-check to anything, check Adnan Horshan, <laughs> the sauce photo. That's uh, mad, That's one of the characters uh. that, that I met. And then during the course of Adnan telling me a story, uh, another a Scottish boy came in, Steve, Stephen, Stephen told me, he's Steph. We orange guy, we rangers the photo. And he pulled me aside and gave me some tobacco and said, you have to go in the exercise yard tomorrow. Went, yeah. Who, to see who? Uh, the IRA I thought the IRA what the fuck the only IRA want to see me for so anyway if you don't go on you need to go you're a shite bag don't you're not that. so I've, I'm out in exercise and uh, I remember vaguely another Scottish guy coming up with grey hair and uh, he's walking how you doing my name's Paul Mick how you doing uh, and I had to say to him after the second lap Mick you need to fuck off here because I might be in a bit of trouble and he surprised me by saying, well, I'm way, I'm, if you're in trouble, I'm in trouble. I went, no, 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 you can't, you don't fight with these sort of people. I went, who? I went, it's the IRA. And he said, it's me. <laughs> he was the IRA. <laughs> <laughs> he was on remand for uh-huh. the mortar bomb attack in Heathrow Airport. And I, and I thought, and it, we, we had a lot in common. He stayed in Lansfield Key, I stayed mm-hmm. in Lansfield Key. And I remember seeing surveillance in Lansfield Key. I thought it was for me, it was obviously for him. And then I go to the, the nitty gritty and I said, well, what, what can I do for my... He said, could you get me hair dye? And I thought, hair dye? And try to get a fucking... I could have gone that. I'm, try I'm trying to get a couple of joints there. <laughs> fucking hair dye. And I, don't, and I don't want to look like Morgan said, no, you, I, I've never been asked that. So there's always a way to get something. Mm-hmm. So I was being truthful by saying, leave it with me and I'll see what can be done. Uh, no blown my own trumpet to see if it could there's always something that can of be course. done of course did right? he have a bud or something coming up or uh, no well what? what I'd asked him but this was another fucking weird thing I said to him so what colour was your hair before <laughs> before we were out and he said uh, ginger and I thought ginger I ain't fucking buying hair dye so I thought mm-hmm. what you do is you always, how long have you been on remand Mick he said three year I said why do you need to check dye your hair he says, I need somebody that's already identified me as the guy with the ginger hair. All right. I said, you obviously go die in the house. He went, aye, but I can get my wife to get another new bottle. I went, do that. Because that way you know the colour. There's that variations of different colour. I've never fucking died here in my life, especially ginger hair. <laughs> so I called off the, the exercise to go up to what you call the bubble where you get clothes that's been sent in, socks, underpants, boxers, t-shirts, tracksuits. And that's when I, I met another guy called Edgar Pierce, an older guy, he was called the Mardi Gras bomber. And it, it, he was famous for putting explosives in uh, Sainsbury's bags and leaving them back in that case, really. Uh, but he had the biggest pair of drawers I've ever seen, it, like a big <laughs> massive pair of underpants. <laughs> right? Even the screw was laughing, God, Edgar. Come on, look at this one. And there's a story with it because he ended up getting that much abuse with it. He ditched them, but they were brand new. Mm-hmm. And I thought, that's an idea. Hill walking socks. So I told Mick, the IRA boy, to get his wife to put all the hair dye in the socks, let it dry out, and then send them in along with T-shirts, boxers, and, mm-hmm. and they got them. And that was the day I got elevated for the laundry man to being the laundry man and the barber. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I've never cut hair in my fucking so life. So you thought you were going to potentially an IRA or wanting maybe do you? And I don't know. I don't I know. I, I know. I'm no anti-politics. Uh, uh, and yet he's wanting a bottle of fucking hair dye. No, no, I think it's because... I'm were you the man to get I, stuff into the jails? No, no, no. I think the whole position was uh, I'm Scottish, I'm Glaswegian. Uh, I'm one of these ain type of people, mm-hmm. sort of thing, Glaswegian. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and that's just a request that's probably his first time and I'm a seasoned veteran by that time so uh, by the time I get his, his, his hair dry I need to look for a stash before I do anything and because I'm in the laundry room I've seen 
Edgar Pierce's Thunder Pants lying there. <laughs> and I thought, that's a cracker. So I've got a Mars bar, turned the drawers inside out, and went mm-hmm. right in as though it's on these no white Shut tires. Yourself. Right. So that was in the laundry bag. The socks were in the laundry bag. And then at night time, that was me doing my haircut, my barbing. But I did, so I get somebody who was cutting hair mm-hmm. to go and cut Max hair first. Somebody on the phone to keep keep watch, and then somebody on the landing to prevent somebody coming up for the cell. So in uh, these prison cells, you've got a sink. So when he's sitting down in the sink, I've got tepid water. There's a mirror on it, but you can't see it. So I've got this sock, dipped it into the tepid water, and it went fluorescent fucking orange, like high vis jacket. Mm-hmm. And I thought, that's a bit severe, it's going for great to this. Mm-hmm. So I'm rubbing it in his hair. And my hands looked as though I smoked 300 fucking cigarettes a day, right? And I've got these eyebrows, so I've done it. And I'm, I'm thinking, I think we're going to fall out here. Uh-huh. We're going to fall out. And I'm getting ready for, for rolling about. And I went, there you go, Max. So he's dried his hair, jumped up, looked in the mirror, and went, I'm fucking perfect. You know? I went, but we'd already, put our name, we'd, already, we'd already put our name down for pool. And the rules are they keep the white ball, all the rest of the balls are in there mm-hmm. for security reasons in case somebody puts it in a sock and whacks them. Or the pool cue, somebody gets whacked on it. So you need to sign them out. And that Scotty screw was there and he's sitting down the crossword and he's shouting, Fire is Gallica for pool. So I'm there anyway, I'm trying to get this fucking ginger dye off my hands. And I remember taking the, we still couldn't come off. So I've took the ball and I've signed for it. So I'm playing on the table with the ball, waiting for this. Mick take him down, he's on the top landing and it was like a catwalk as soon as I've looked up and I'm trying to look away because there's other prisoners going look at him mm-hmm. it's as though it was a new guy on the wing it mm-hmm. wasn't it, it was him he just had his hair uh-huh. down swaggering down the fucking stairs gets to the, the desk with the screw he's gave him the pool cue and he's done a double take next thing he's lifted the phone uh, the alarm bells went off <laughs> everybody's locked up because he's changed his identity <laughs> and they never found the die so I had to top it up every two or three months mm-hmm. and, and, and I, I did make a throwaway comment but I think it was took the wrong way and maybe I've not explained it properly but I wasn't making any disrespect to, towards people who have died for the cause physically died mm-hmm. for the cause but after the fourth or fifth thing I said to Mick I must be the only guy who died for the cause that many times mm-hmm. uh, just because of the die uh-huh. and whether it worked for him at court I don't know but uh, that was that was one of the, the funniest episodes just seeing the screw's face <laughs> and, the, and the hair dye and I thought fucking loads of characters in here did they get sentenced did you know uh, I'm not too sure what mm-hmm. happened I get, I get moved away mm-hmm. uh, before it and I think he did get convicted I'm not too sure whether the hair dye worked or not Bill Marsh has got some heavy names in it Paul that's the category is in it the well, no, well we were uh, that's kind of it's still very secure but there's a place called the SSU which mm-hmm. is a super secure unit uh, I was never in it that's where you get double catty Aye. that was in it so uh, not that I want to see it again I know. It. but it was secure even the family to get visits how, how that used to work was uh, my sister first came down I had to get a closed visit and the cops had to yeah you've got to put down who you want to come and visit you the prison staff take the details and then they, they put it out to the nearest local authority who then send the local uh, cops to the door. They take photographs to prove who she is. They send the photographs back. And then when they turn up at prison, they take a, take the fingerprints and that photograph should match up with the photographs that the police had took. And that's the only way mm-hmm. you get in. What were you doing in England? I was visiting. <laughs> no, I, I, I came down just on the, on the, the chance mm-hmm. of seeing some extended mm-hmm. family. Mm-hmm. And genuinely that day I was going to collect some photographs with my old mate, Arthur Sutty. Aye. I've interviewed a lot of people now, Paul, mm-hmm. as you know. Listen, I'm no daft. Some people came on the show and I go, fucking idiot, you're talking pish. Mm-hmm. But yourself, and not to blow smoke up your ass, but everybody I speak to for the boat, mate, England to the top of Scotland, you're very well respected. Everybody speaks very highly of you. Why is that? I think if you're keeping your life true to you and you're not blowing smoke up your inners and you're, you're keeping it real, <laughs> basically, mm-hmm. and then it's not a Johnny Bravo scenario. Mm-hmm. It's just 
I've never liked bullies. I don't like bullies. And if I'm asked a question, I'll answer it as best as I can. And if it will, if it will hurt somebody, I'll, I'll try and amend what I've got to say so it don't didn't hurt them. Mm-hmm. But there are people who are due their ears to be bashed, and mm-hmm. I'm no one for holding back either. So you tell it how it is. People like you for it, or they don't like you for it. It's just one of the things, James. Was Big Bronson in it, Bill Marsh, at well, the time you were strange, there? Well, the strange thing about it is that the Iraqi uh, guy that I met, Adnan Horshan, who hijacked the Sudanese Airbus, was took hostage <laughs> with Charles Bronson. And I get told the whole story about that. And, and I said to him, Adnan, what, what happened with Charlie Bronson? He said, oh, he's mad. <laughs> he said, they bust a pillow, gave them a, a, a feather each, took his shoes and socks off and told them to tickle his feet. He's never laughed for a while. Cause he's, <laughs> and he said, we've just come out of one death situation, maybe hijacked and kidnapped mm-hmm. for this crack pot. So Charlie Bronson's demand was a couple of cheeseburgers and a helicopter, and they'd wanted Adnan to fly it. And in Charlie Bronson's mind, that's because he's hijacked an airplane, it would then follow that he can fly an heli- a helicopter. Doesn't he work like that? Two different separate things. So he told him if he didn't get the cheeseburgers, he was going to start eating the hostages. <laughs> <laughs> Mad <laughs> fucking case. Pre- I think he might be getting it in the next I year hope, or two. I, well, I hope he does, because he's done man some nonce fucking... Yeah, he definitely. So mm-hmm. he's, he's somebody who, Joey Powell used to look after him in it. Uh, he's very well got, but hopefully he gets given a chance and gets his freedom. Right, so good luck to him. Mm-hmm. You went to Full Sutton after mm-hmm. Belmarsh. Yep. What was that charge? Uh, it was the same charge, James. It just the, the move. You're just getting ghosted. You don't. You don't, uh, you don't get asked to move. They just come in and move. Why? You. But you high risk. No, no. For Belmarsh, Belmarsh is a bit like Berlin. It's a holding prison. Mm-hmm. It's not a long term. It's not a uh, somewhere we we, we do your your, your long term uh, uh, prison then, or your sentence rather so they moved me for Belmarsh to Full Sutton and what I never knew when I arrived in Full Sutton was I met another couple of Irish guys but I never knew I was the subject to an internal IRA investigation in the prison because there was a, a, a kind of spurious newspaper article saying I'd been providing loyalists with firearms and a load of bullets, but enough to get you fucking mm-hmm. a, 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 a bit of attention. So same thing again, IRA wants to see me in the the, the, the exercise yard, and then it went for there, out of the, the football fields. And there's three or four football fields, and there's uh, visitors changing rooms for other uh, football teams that come in but that's usually where all the punishments happen and all the rest of it so that's where the, the kangaroo courts are mm-hmm. that's where things happen mm-hmm. and uh, I was asked to go and attend to speak to this guy not for me to speak he's wanted to speak to me and it, and it turns out there wasn't a lot of talking I was to do I was to do a lot of listening but in a nice way they were nice about it and what they had said to us is uh, do you need to realise why you're here and I went no but I'm sure you're going to tell me he's went you fucking fuzzy was. We know you're not with us, which means the IRA, and we know you're not with them, which is the loyalists. And I went, right. He says, in my mind, that makes you a capitalist. <laughs> and I laughed, and I thought, is that good or bad? <laughs> He's went, oh, it depends what it is. I said, does that happen? He's went, just about. And see, before you go, just so I'd let you know, we've got nothing to talk to Davey in here, but tell your brother, we ain't forgot what he'd done in 1975. And I thought, oh, fucking well. You know, so they're intelligence gathering, they know everything, James. Mm-hmm. They know I'm not involved with them. They, they, it was to do with the, the machine guns and explosives. They think it's terrorism and you must be servicing somebody. The truth about it was it, it never. How did your brother do? Uh, I'm not too sure. But somebody said that he kidnapped uh, one of the IRA <laughs> or, or held him hostage or, or, or there was a bomb and uh, Wakefield prison. I don't really know. I was only a young boy, James. Mm-hmm. I was fucking 10, 11. So. How many is in your family, Paul? Uh, five or one. Who's the, you're the youngest? Oh, no, I've got a young sister. Four yeah. sisters. Is it? Oh, sorry, three sisters. Mm-hmm. Franklin Prison after Phil Sutton. Mm-hmm. That was a three year stunt. Mm-hmm. What was that for? Uh, no, no. That was, uh, Franklin Prison was again moved under the under the basis that when I get took me fel- to Belmarst and then got found guilty mm-hmm. at, at the Old Bailey, they originally gave me 45 years. It was 15 years, 15 years, 10 years. 
And I thought, fuck, I, I thought I was getting 10 years. I was getting the maximum anyway, mm-hmm. James. There was no doubt about that. But I was budgeted for 10 years. And then when I heard the 15, the 15, and the rest of it, I thought, I'm five years out somewhere. Uh, took a couple of steps down the stairs, and then I heard a familiar voice calling his back off. The judge had exceeded his powers, uh, so he had to reduce it. The maximum was a 10, so I got 10, 10, and 5, and I thanked him for it. Or on concurrent? Or concurrent. So it was the same sentence going for Belmarsh to uh, Phil Sutton, for Phil Sutton to, to Franklin. That's the same sentence. So just all remands and then your sentence? Aye. What was Franklin like? Franklin, Franklin was a good player. I like Frank, Franklin. Uh, they'd ran, ran quite a good regime there. Uh, I'd done my, my course material there for the substance abuse, uh, enhanced thinking skills, cognitive awareness. Uh, and it was kind of funny because I tried to enrol in the psychology course on full Sutton. And I was only two days into it and get moved. But Franklin don't do psychology courses. The only mm-hmm. way they could swap it is give me a, a cookery course. And I thought... That's a bit of a leap, going for psychology to cookery courses. So I just got my head down, met the Manchester boys in there and just started working away in the circuits and then playing badminton and getting myself fit. Yeah, good badminton player? I, I thought I was until I played a good badminton mm-hmm. player. You end up doing an average of a mile, the wee dinks through the net. So mm-hmm. I was no bad, I was average. What good. kind of cats were you in with then? Uh, it was all... Uh, Treble way, double way, single way. So high risk. Aye, all aye, the psychopaths. What what boys in that were you in with? Did you meet any pals uh, there? I met I met a couple of boys that was in there. Again another Irish Irish boy. Um, crazy we'll call him. Uh, who'd escaped for a couple of uh, Dutch prisons. And that was him over in the UK to finish his sentence. Met a couple of Manchester boys. Uh, one of the strangest ones was uh, when I went to Franklin, they, when they move you, you don't get told you move, so you can't take any food with you. And it's normal uh, hospital situation where you go and get checked out and then back onto the wing. And there was a, another Scottish guy there, Grant Turnbull, and he gave me a, what you call a food parcel, a couple of sausages, bits of bacon, a couple of eggs, bits of bread. And I thought, fuck, I'm going to make a, a breakfast. Mm-hmm. Talking beans and different things like that. But what I never knew was the kitchen that I'm using, they don't cook bacon in it, don't cook pork in it. It, it's, it was a, a Muslim yardy uh, Rastafarian uh, kitchen. And I met one of the one of the Rasta boys in Belmarsh and that kind of saved my bacon, for want of a better word, uh, because I had the bacon under the grill pan. And uh, I could sense a bit of tension because it was... Th- three or five of them standing. They all looked like big basketball players. Didn't matter what they were, they always looked to fucking put. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking, I'm banging trouble here. So I put my oil in the in the frying pan. If that's all you had, James, there are no weapons, it's just, are you going to chase them a frying pan? Fucking, aye, if you need to. <laughs> right, so, and then Zebby, a guy that I knew, a Rasta guy I knew, was in for a contract killing. Called me Scotty Soldier, gave us a cuddle, but he's looked over my shoulder and went, What the fuck? <laughs> you get bacon under the grill. So I told him I'd wash it. Mm-hmm. I said, Look, there's no hassle, I'll wash it. No, you can't wash it. You've used bacon and fucking, you, you just can't wash it for. I thought, right, Not a problem. I'll go down and ask for a new one. And he went, No. I said, Yeah, I'll go down and get a new one. He went, No. There's a screw in there called Markham. He used to do a bit of training, but I think he took me a story, steroids, because he was, he was puffed out and he was always fucking. He's always a rah rah. I try to show off to one of the female screws and the young blonde thing. She was tidy, right enough, but he was like big Charlie Potato in the castle. Now, I've seen a few screws like that, mm-hmm. right? They don't intimidate me, James. I just want to grill pan, that's all. Like, you get the boys back. Mm-hmm. But he's, he's sitting at his desk with two minders. Uh, so I've come walking down. He obviously knew who I was. Uh, they, they didn't get intelligence reports, so they, they're familiar. They, they get showed photographs, so they recognise you on the wing. So I went over and said to him, uh, "Excuse me, sir." And he's went, "Yes, Ferris." So he knew right away. Yes, Ferris. How can we help you? I said, uh, "I'd like to get a new grill pan." He went really sat back, and folded his arms. He thought I'm asking for a new grill pan for me. I'm the big gangster in the jail, and I've no. He said, "What's wrong with?" It? I said, "It's unclean." Never told them anything because you, you can't tell the story, James, because mm-hmm. it's, it's a racial thing, right? I said, it's unclean. 
He said, son, clean it. He said, why don't you clean it? I said, why don't you just get the fucking grill fan? Because they'll be in the storeroom in a box, take it up, put a screw on it, and then put the handle back on. And he went, what if I don't? I said, all right, bang. So I've hurt the riot bell. The reason why I've hurt the riot bell was because somebody more senior rank than him, like a governor, has got to come onto the wing to say what happened. So anyway, I get ruffled, <laughs> <laughs> threw into the cell, and they think, oh, I said, hey, I'm not even in the fucking jail an hour. I'm not even got my breakfast yet, really, or my food. A uh, short time later, door opens. Everybody's locked up. Door opens. The screw and Alsatian, the other ones with fucking plastic shields, some that he judged red, or looking in, and all of a sudden the shields part like the fucking the Red Sea and this governor appears. Right, Ferris, what's the problem? I says, he's done none. Well, what did you hit the, the right bell for? I said, because that guy over there, the senior officer, Markham, Whatever his domestic problems is, he shouldn't bring it into prison. He's got a terrible attitude. And if he spoke to me like that on the outside, I'd have smacked him right over the fucking head with a frying pan. Mm-hmm. He says, what, what about the frying pan? And I said, I never got a chance to explain to him. I went into the wrong kitchen. I've grilled some bacon in a, a Rastafarian kitchen. Told them I'd clean it, and they said, no, it's unclean for I'd like a new one. I said, so... I'm either going to get a new one or we're going. I'm going to have to be rolling about with these yardies. Mm-hmm. And he said, is it that serious? I went, it's only a grill fan. You must have stuff in the store. He said, so forget your grill pan. Is that, that funny stuff? Like <clears throat> get him on a grill fan. <laughs> <laughs> Shut the door. Mm-hmm. So that was a bit of a bust his bubble, that one. Mm-hmm. So I got the grill pan, gave him it back and uh, walking along the landing to the Michael Jordan basketball player stepped in and went, the boss wants to see you, the head of the yard crew. And I thought, yeah, here we go. So it's a cell with the curtains shut. And it's a big glow like that, James. What he's got is a cone it's full of weed, right? And then he's going up. <laughs> and the whole cell's lighting up. No lighting up, but it's noticeable. But of Bob Marley in the background. And he's going, you know Zebby? I went, you know Zebby? He's went, yeah. Thanks for the girl, fan. I'm smart fucking stone then I had a, a puff for a while I was fucking <laughs> rocking was I it was skunk doing, I, was, I kept my food for later on but I munchies munchies I went back into the kitchen <laughs> I, I brought my kitchen right uh-huh. on and I'm telling people the story they're going oh what about? they all loved it because they, they hated this Markham mm-hmm. <clears throat> he was a bit of a bully so I ended up made my peace with them and then the, they called us out to get done to the medical wing uh, for no other reason, James, I had psoriasis, I need to get done and get my creams. <clears throat> so at this occasion, Grant Turnbull, he had HIV at the time and was on his medication. He's always up and done. And a strange thing happened where he was in the, the waiting room, <clears throat> excuse me, he's in the waiting room and he said, Paul, watch us. He shouted in Harold Chapman. Harold Chapman's uh, the mass fucking doctor, yeah, yeah, crack yeah. Fought, fucking killed everybody is in the hospital wing and what separates the cell that we're in and the, the medical unit and the hospital wing is just a courtyard, just a, a garden where they go out and sit. But Grant's shouting through the windows to him, uh, what medication should I get? So Grant's got a fucking pen and piece of paper getting diagnosed with this crack for it. You, you wouldn't be trusting him telling you what medication to get. But the funny story was <laughs> Shipman get moved because Grant's went in, Grant Turnbull's went in, told the doctor what he should be getting. And the doctor's thinking, who the fuck's talking to him? Mm-hmm. Because they give you the non-expensive medication and uh, the famous one in Berlin, it was all three. You get a, it didn't matter what was wrong with you, your leg hanging off or fucking <laughs> somebody big scar down there. <laughs> I, 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 I smashed the bits, all three, paracetamol and on your way. Mm-hmm. So Grant's asking for specific medication. Uh, so shipmen get moved. So that's a kind of they were in, they were separated. They were in a, the non-swing. What was it like being stoned, Paul, on the green in the jail? We you know paranoid as fuck. Nah, no, that was just one of the ones. I thought it's a fucking five-star hotel. <laughs> you've got you've got your cooking facilities, and a strange thing happened as well. Uh, in my first day, they've given me an application form to fill in to go back and spend the rest of my my time. And the Scottish prison. Now, mm-hmm. I've been in the Scottish prison, James. Mm-hmm. What I've recognised English prison as, 
I've looked at the canteen list and I thought, after the three pages, it's all spices mm -hmm. and rice and whatever else. Mm -hmm. And then you get a meat section, they go to butchers and buy all your stuff. And what? I, 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 you, you can cook, you don't need to eat prison food, you cook mm -hmm. your own stuff. And what you got in there is you're allowed £30 out of your private cash. And then if you had a decent job, which I ended up getting, you get another 15. So you get 45 quid a week mm -hmm. to, to shop. So you're buying, we had a fridge, we had a, one of the deep freezers that was full mm -hmm. with chicken breasts, uh, fish. Was that to keep you steak. happy? I, I think I think it's because you're in a long-term prison. Mm -hmm. they, they want to kind of make you self-sufficient. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a luxury. The, the more they give you, the more you're going to lose. So if somebody kicks off, uh, you lose the, all your luxuries. there's three standards. There's mm -hmm. a, an enhanced where you get 30 pounds. There's a standard where you get, I don't know, you get 30 quid, you get something. And basic is just, <laughs> basically you get fuck all. Oh, uh, you don't even get enough for tobacco. So that's one, it's an incentive to keep your head down and go on with mm -hmm. And I ended up, that's where I, I learned to cook. There was Chinese people in there, drug smugglers, Asian guys. So, and their mums taught them how to cook and they're there teach me how to cook. So mm -hmm. before long I'm wrapping up fucking mm -hmm. Chinese curries, kebabs. <laughs> Uh, and then you cut the Irish boys in there was making the pachin and then because you, you've got a fridge freezer you've got ice cubes what's pachin? pachin was what they used to do this was ingenious right <clears throat> they would add a, use a mixture of rice and potato and the triangle of the pool table and the snooker table always went missing and you were allowed an iron in your cell if you, had, if you were having a visit or your iron in your clothes and the pots for the kitchen. So what they done with the triangle was put the 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 iron inverted upside down in the triangle and then put the pot on top of the, the iron that heats the pot up, that heats the water up. And over a weekend, they used to tape all their doors so the smell wouldn't get out. And over a weekend, they'd probably get about two, two litres of pachin. And there was a straw, a tube that comes out the pot that goes into a plastic bag that's the shape of a diamond and then the bottom of the bag it just drips so the condensation they're taking all the alcohol that's the fucking dynamite that stuff oh blow your head off right so and there was another pal of mine I got to meet Kevin Lane uh, Catwalk Kevy was called right uh, his family brilliant guy he would have been a, a champion boxer but he got fitted up for a contract killing and he came in one, one day and he's went Paul, how you doing? My name's Kevin. I went, how you doing, Kevin? He's went, that one here's Jelly Knight and that one here's Dynamite. You get any trouble one here, let me know. And I thought, mm. brilliant. I said, how do you know of me? And he's went, words have been set up. Arthur Sutty, Joey File, stuff out his sock, there's fucking tobacco, phone cards, puff. And then he said, what are you doing Friday? <laughs> I thought, man, <laughs> Nick, not my day on Friday. I said, what are you doing You're Friday? You're in the terror, no? Honestly, he was, he was funny as fuck, Kevin. Mm -hmm. I said, what my day on Friday? What are you doing Friday? Going to the pub. I like you going to the pub. I said, what pub? He's went, mine's. In the cell. So he'd shut the curtains out. <clears throat> Kevin does his karaoke, but he's a good boxer. Not that good at singing. <laughs> After the Pacini sounded all uh -huh. right. So what you'd get is like clear bottles like that full mm -hmm. of pachin and then somebody would be sent up to get with fresh orange and then with ice cubes and just sat and fucking have puffing fun. and having a drink Aye, and then eating so you you, you worked your, your day around you get your job done you go and do your education you get mm -hmm. your classes done go into the gymnasium and then Sunday was usually a, a lion a long lion so that, that when I say how good it was you're still in prison of course. you've still got your family leaving the table mm -hmm. uh but a lot of fucking madness goes on. In there oh, as well. aye, aye, aye. Try to make the most of a bad decision on it. So when you go out then after your ten, your last sentence was that Durham? No, no. This is all. This is all the same. This is the same one. When I got out, uh, there was a f a spurious fucking a claim that my girl had stabbed me or I'd been stabbed during the, during the thing, and I get recalled for it. All the rest of it. It's supposed to be a shipment of fucking puff and. Uh, Nonsense. Mm -hmm. uh, police intelligence report. So, uh, do you get a rec recall I, for that? I, I, no, I get recall. I get told by the social uh, services uh, that was my, my license is now revoked. It meant I'm back on cat A 
which means I'm a danger to the public. And I know what's happening, James. All they could do is starve Clyde is arrest me and take me all the way down. I didn't think I'd make that journey because you might get banged on the basis that they're saying you try to escape. So I decided I'll go and hand myself back in. Mm-hmm. And good idea. Uh, I got the guy who done the serialisation for the book, David Leslie for News of the World, Brian Anderson, the photographer. So that was my witnesses to make sure I get back done mm-hmm. and hand myself into Durham, uh, which is, it was quite funny because I've never been in Durham. You, there's local cop, local cop station. So when I was in Durham, we asked for directions. So I've got, no, it's no suited up. I'm smart enough. I've got my hold on. And we're directed to this uh, police station. It turns out not of a police station. It's a police academy uh, mm-hmm. where I've gone to hand myself in. And as we're driving in, a minibus of young people was coming in and out. And there was a, an older screw there who looked at me and went, ah, in a Geordie accent, why, I son, you just missed them, they're away in the train. He thought it was a fucking recruit to get into the, the training college. <laughs> and he's buzzed the door open. <laughs> and I was going up these set of stairs and there's a big massive poster about be vigilant, be aware, terrorism is everywhere. And I thought, I think we're in the wrong place. And we're walking up into these big banqueting halls and seeing cabinets full of silverware, trophies and photographs. And I thought, no, we're in the wrong place. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just looking for a charge desk. And as we came out, I was like, where the fuck is this? And the same screw had said, you lost, son? I went, "Eh? where is it you want to go? I said, to hand myself in. She said, what for? And I've told them. So next thing he's holding his earpiece and he's coming and went, put your hand, put, put your hold on in the middle of the car park and put your cat hands behind your head and step back. And I thought, oh, I'm a danger now. Before it, he's letting me in everywhere. So mm-hmm. the boss swooped in, got us, and uh, took us to the right cops sort this time. And they're all laughing. And I remember there's an inner courtyard in there. So I'm out getting a bit of exercise. And there's a screw came up and went, do you want some of your cigarettes out? And I thought, what a change in attitude. Normally you get fuck all in Scotland. Mm-hmm. You're part of your abuse. So I went, what? Eh? He said, can I ask you a question? I went, depends. She said, how far did you get in the training college? And I told him, I got to the banquet and suite and all the trophies. He mm-hmm. went, <gasps> <laughs> he's run away and told every gun where, <laughs> where, where I got. And it was a bit of a scandal because mm-hmm. it breached all their security. Mm-hmm. Uh, so for there, I ended up uh, next day, oh no, within a couple of hours, re- license revoked, took to Durham, another shithole, probably worse than Valenny. Again, right down the side, because they don't hold the uh, catty prisoners. And I was offered an inducement, and they said to us, look, we don't want to keep you in the seg, you've done most of your sentence, you're on a recall, there's a Scottish boy up there with a TV in his cell. Would you want to go and banged up with him? I went, is that a coloured one? He said, of course it is. I went, go. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I've got banged up, got access to colour TV. The guy with Paul, we eat so. He was Mad Ranger supporter. Uh, he knew all the crowd that I didn't even get on with. And it, so it, it, was a, it was a truce. There was nothing happening in, in the Nick. So he was doing time for important cannabis. Uh, and I remember the, the priest coming in and got a set of rosary beads and it was like the exorcist room. He's like, oh, fucking rosary beads, <laughs> you fiend. <laughs> so a bit of banter mm-hmm. with him, And all of a sudden I get moved one day while he's at work and I put the rosary beads on his pillow. <laughs> <laughs> I sent him a letter <laughs> and I got word, but I fucking found him after that. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So, aye, so, it, it was, Durham was, mm-hmm. uh, not as bad as Pentonville, uh, no, as bad as uh, Valenny either, but it was a shit hole. Mm-hmm. So, going through all that then, Paul, you, I even though you spoke in the first podcast about the coppers trying to set up and kill you, you mm-hmm. just mentioned that there again, was it always in the back of your mind that they were going to put one in your nut? Uh, I've experienced it personally, uh, on my own, uh, in Rossi, uh, 1984, when they kicked the door in, there was three of them that was armed. Turns out only two of them should have been armed. So if there are three guns, I'm quite aware of you'll remember how many guns is pointed. The one's going to get used on you and Ben. I think so. I think so. I, uh, especially in the nature, professionally done, James. Don't I'm, I'm no criticising and happened, but 
going out into the hallway, hands outstretched to identify I've not got any weapons. Mm-hmm. Boom, right up in the air, face down, left hand side of the face down on the floor. This one's kneeling in my back, pushing the gun in. So I can see him. I can, I can look that way. Uh, six feet two, snow white hair. George Dixon, his name was, and he put the gun in the back of my head and said, what's the effect? You know what this is, you little bastard, you're going to get it. And as he said that, uh, my partner at the time, Anne-Marie, let out a massive scream. They never knew there was a female in the house. That kind of saved me, I think. And then uh, it was paranoid. It was me thinking, well, what else are you going to think, James, mm-hmm, if that's happening to you, right? So and then when Russell Sturton told me about uh, the approach that's been done to him, as, as much as I didn't want to believe it, it was just, I'm on red alert. I'm ready for anything, anything at all. Uh, walking, driving about with fucking guns, and I'm thinking, if they try it, I'm going to give it to them first. Do you think the hash uh, played a part in that as well? But no, no, I never smoked, I never smoked, never took nothing. I was just on red alert, nothing. The only thing I did probably take is a bit of speed just to make sure I'm fucking, I'm on alert. So you buzzing out your tits, man? No, nah, I was just... I know what I've got to do. I've got money to go and collect. I've mm-hmm. got to go and do my business. But I'm aware it would, would liable to happen. And then I, 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 everything not changed, James, when I got remanded uh, in Berlin for that, uh, that particular case. And then you get the transcripts of the audio tapes that I'd done and Russell Sturton had done. More importantly, one Russell Sturton had done. He took a visor out his car, cut the padding out it and put a secret tape recording in it I think Russell had already threatened the cops at some stage anyway so they wanted to speak to him and ironically what happened was it was a cop called Eric Mitchell detective sergeant in Bird Street that pulled Russell over and Russell never got out of his car just put the window down and I was leaning in mate just talking to this and this is what he said to him stop threatening the uh, 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 police officers, Russell, because your wee pal Paul tried it once. And I can tell you here now, he was nearly wasted. He was nearly for a walk away up in the camps his one night and was never nearer going. And if I think you're serious about threatening Paul's son, you'll just be going on a night fishing trip and won't be coming back either. So Russell knows he's wired up. He just laughs and goes, ah, I would like that. No, there I've got it in audio tape. Not me, I might be accused of a lot of things. I ain't a fucking ventriloquist. So when I'm on remand and I get this, I'm actually reading a magazine. And it's not a porn magazine, it's a magazine. <laughs> I did read porn magazines, it was wrong, but this occasion I'm reading this thing about biometrics, and it's to do with access control into NASA, where they're doing away with cards and IDs and the things that you've got to take to work is your hands and your eyes and your voice. So there's three levels to get in. So certain employees use their voice, everybody uses their voice to get in. Mm-hmm. The second one is the palm scanner, and then the third one is your voice, your iris, and your palm scanner. And I focused on the voice. The voice, you can get a voice graph analyst test done because everybody's got a voice indistinguishable like a fingerprint. And I was wanting this uh, audio tape, your serving police officer checked to make sure it is him. And they didn't deny it. And we were teed up for getting an American. Uh, expert in on the voice graph analyst and he admitted in court that was his voice but he also said and dismissed the whole uh, cross examination for Donald Finley looked right at the jury and said ladies and gentlemen jury when you're dealing with severe criminals like him the police use a, a procedure called bluff and counter bluff I was only kidding now, I didn't know where to fall out the dock or stand up and clap. Mm-hmm. It was a good fair play and we blagged it. Mm-hmm. But the serious thing about it is, see if there's no training course in Tully Allen that deals with bluff and counter bluff. Not only is he committed perjury, the threats were real. Mm-hmm. So that ended the paranoia. So you do think that they were out to, aye, to kill you? Aye, without a doubt. Do you think they've got that pulls out what they did then? The elite? We've done it for. Aye. We've done it for. Scary that, isn't it? It is, but it's, it's an occupational hazard. Mm-hmm. Don't, don't be going out and doing what you're doing and don't mm-hmm. expect them to treat you with kids. Part and class. parcel of the game, do you think? That is part and parcel of the game. So when you get out in 2002, how have you managed a man with your reputation to stay out the last 18 years? Was there a time you'd realised it's not for me anymore? I or? did. It was very early on and it was in the Belmars when... I was unaware that I was under 
uh, investigation with MI5 and security services that or list of other agents. And it's only when I go my productions, your, your case file uh, for my solicitor, I've looked through it, seen all the surveillance reports. And these witnesses never had names. It was witness A. And I had the whole fucking alphabet near enough. Witness A, 23 years, security service, bum, bum, bum. So I became aware that when you come to the attention to the level of these sort of people, you're either going to give it up or you're going away for a long, long time. So that was my motivation to look at and go, you never thought you'd come to the attention of these people. I'm going to get my head down, going to go on my sentence. So when I, I get released on the 21st of January uh, 2002, uh, I was met outside with Reg Mackay uh, because we'd, we'd wrote the book by that time. But equally, there was maybe half a dozen reporters and, and I told them I was going straight. Uh, they want an interview and I said, I can't, I've got to get back to Glasgow and uh, see my social worker. I've got a time scale, I need to go and do this. And people laughed. He's going straight, Leopard can't change his spots and all the rest of it. First and foremost, I ain't a Leopard, and I ain't got spots. Mm -hmm. So... It was a commitment to me and my family and my friends that stood by me. And most, most, more importantly, Reg. Reg gave me that uh, belief in myself, that he believed that I tended to do it, and I did do it. Mm -hmm. Just fortunate Reg wasn't here to see the whole show. But if it wasn't for Reg, I wouldn't be sitting here with you tonight. Mm -hmm. Do you miss him, Paul? I missed, uh, he, he was, he was um, not only my partner in crime writing, he was my mentor, he was my previous social worker, uh, a good friend and somebody was very out we, we called him the champion of lost causes because he always used to take people on that was just kind of fun mm -hmm. and he would take them on and uh, give them a bit of self esteem back give them a bit of faith back in mm -hmm. the system or whatever it is but he, he was quite a controversial figure Ridge. and out of all the books that he wrote and things that he'd done he was never credited because they said that he went native he went too much with me when he never, he went professionally on what he believed in. They didn't like me, James, and it's, I don't like them either. So mm -hmm. it was one of these situations where uh, Reg kind of rocked the boat as far as establishment is concerned. He's now writing books about corruption, and it, it's it's something which they see potential jurors reading th stuff like that and going, whoa, and maybe sitting at a trial further down the line going, I read that book. Mm -hmm. This is what they really fucking do. Gone's the day that they got to uh, witness boxes with their uniforms and their medallions and, mm -hmm. and they're taken as face value as, uh, as a respectable witness. It's all about what, what can you prove. And fortunately for me, I've been very lucky. Uh, knowing the system for a young age, uh, having the right legal team. Uh, and I've just exposed them continuously, time after time after time. And I'll still do it. You become a thorn in the side, Paul. Oh, no, a big jaggy nettle bush, aye. but a big tumbleweed thrown down the and going like, that. oh, that's him again. <laughs> aye, so, aye, aye. That, that, and and uh, if, they, if they were doing the job they get paid to do, that's fair enough. They went out with a remit. They supplied maybe drugs, so therefore they're a drug dealer. Mm -hmm. Don't think you can do something like that and then jump behind a warrant card and a uniform and say, aha, no, no, you've, you've gave that up. You became a drug dealer, you became a gangster with guns and... That, that, that's how I viewed it. Mm -hmm. I was I threatened them, but I never threatened the cop. Mm -hmm. I threatened somebody who was acting a gangster. Aye. Your biggest rivalry, Paul, was Tam McGraw. You was the biggest rivalry in Glasgow between you two at one point. How did that start? There, there's, there's no real rivalry. You can't... It, there, I, I knew about Tam McGraw before I met him. I knew he was a grass before I met him. And I knew I had to be careful with saying anything and run about him. So an adversary... No, for that start, no, even for, for a matter. Uh, might have had a lot of money, but you take away some of the stuff that he'd been involved in, uh, like, like the Doyle murders, uh, two innocent guys, several innocent people getting convicted at it. Tommy Cam ended up being related to me, married my, my cousin. Uh, and, and I always felt a rerun, it, it, that misfortune. A big fucking lump of a guy like Tommy going on hunger strike, done to seven stone to prove his innocence, fighting his corner all away, and then you get this slippery bastard, McGraw, the fucking snake, I called him. And I, and I did try to say it in one word, and I couldn't say it in one word, so I'll repeat it again. He's a fucking snake, and people now know what he done, and so did the coppers very early on know what he's done. So you can't have 
a drugs war on ice cream vans when it was fuck all to do with drugs. It was to do with ice cream vans. It was to stop people doing their runs. And it was a personal dispute. So the rivalry with my girl, we knew what he was all about. He was a dog. And it was just one of these things where newspapers play up to it. Mr. Big this, Mr. Big that. Mm-hmm. We only tolerated him because he had a fucking pub. That was all that. Well, Joe Hanlon was working with him. So, and I moved into an area thinking I was going away for D Division. <laughs> I ended up going for the frying pan right into the fucking fire. But mm-hmm. apparently mine at Tam Began at the time, he made sure I was all right there. I'll, I'll not forget Tam for that. Mm-hmm. And I always will. So, Tam doesn't like getting mentioned and things like that. But I, I've got to mention this and, and wish him well and good luck mm-hmm. what he's done. Aye, uh, the, the sort of papers. Tam Began, that is no Tam Began. Uh, so the papers blew it up because I've had Joe Steele on and mm. uh, TCO, and they spent over 20 years in prison yep. for a crime they didn't commit. Mm-hmm. Um, seeing loved ones dying while in prison. But, it's but, uh, on that stuff. aspect, James, I know, I've seen your podcast, right? Mm-hmm. You think uh, the police intelligence gathering, do you think they never knew they never done it? Of course they did. Of course they did, aye. But it went against how they teed up the Crown Witness, Billy Love that all of a sudden was on remand for a robbery and they accepted the fact that he'd been identified as a fucking robber and now all of a sudden he couldn't have been on the robbery because he's sitting in the barge pub listening to Tommy Campbell talking about lighting the fire. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so they knew. They knew, they trusted that. Big case, man. That All these years on, the Doyle family still having any closure as well. James, it's one of the the situations where Tommy Campbell and Joe Steele always maintained their integrity all the way throughout because it wasn't for them to point fingers to people and say, I never done it, they fucking done it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I could do that. I don't know if I'd have let them walk about, to be honest with you, but he he did. Uh, he He was a... I'll not keep going on about it, he's not here now anyway. That shows you the strength for... Joe, well, Joe show, and TC, two uh, well, strong it, it, it men. It shows too. you the, the hold that McGraw had over these cotters because mm-hmm. they couldn't let him talk because it's going to expose all the rest of them for mm-hmm. fitting up uh, Joe, uh, Joe Steele and Tommy and, and Big Tamby and all the rest of them. Mm-hmm. With, uh, Joe Granger. A lot of people were unnecessarily put through the mill with that one. And it's bad enough going to prison for something that you've done. I've never been to prison for something that I've never done. I'd like to make that clear mm-hmm. as well. But I don't know if I'd have been able to go to prison for something I didn't do. Mm-hmm. It's a we, different ball game, different that, ball ball game. I would have got involved in something. I don't think I'd have got out, James. It's quite obvious I don't. Mm-hmm. I'd have probably done something in there, going to court and uh, say, that, yeah, I've done that, but I've never done this. Aye. That's the mentality they mm-hmm. push you into. So. Aye. The first podcast you were on, Tommy Robinson got a mention. You it, want me to mention it, him again? It blew up. No, it blew up. And if I'm honest, man, I was just starting off. I probably had the wooden spoon no, out because no, he mentioned it. There was nothing in it. Do, do you know you never mentioned I, anything. No, it was, was, was blown out. A uh, million percent, out it proportion. went national. But to clarify it, uh, I've got Neil Will against Tommy Robinson. Mm-hmm. If he wanted to be running about waving Nazi flags and being more English than the English really want to be, and then getting photographs taken with the Israeli Defence Force and big tanks, I don't know where his head's at. But... He's obviously uh, wanted to do something. It's not for me. I don't know him well enough, but what I can criticise him for was a video that he'd done saying I'd been involved in several murders. Who is he? Trying to make light of it. And it turns out my only view of it was he keeps that up. His security will need security. And that was a throwaway comment. And it ended up people contacting me saying, Paul, his security is freaking out. Is there something going to happen to him? I went, no, it was just a throwaway comment mm-hmm. what, what was that about I said it was just a throwaway comment on a fucking podcast mm-hmm. it was nothing no, no it was nothing I'll tell you what it was James he travelled all the way from England up to a cost of a, a, a politics I'm not into polit- uh, politics I'm no defending a politician what I couldn't get my head around is he never the arsehole to go to Westminster to wait and John Berko coming out because he said the exact same thing saved all the train fares or how he got up maybe the th- he's he's uh, friendly Israelis paid for his transport I don't know but he's got somebody on his doorstep that he could have went and he decided to go and get somebody coming out of a library or something like that mm-hmm. uh, and I cost him so he's a bully and that's what I said that I was an antidote <laughs> for the bullying and yeah. uh, and if he's listening to this one mm-hmm. it wasn't meant like that mm-hmm. but it wasn't you'd asked for a debate and it's when people have jumped on it 
it's, it, got it turned, national. It turned it. into a big girl blouse, and it's, um, and it was. That's awkward. it was. Um, I probably had the wooden spoon it because I'm thinking it's just creating more traffic towards my channel. So James, it's your podcast. You've got every right to mm-hmm. ask whatever relevant questions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, about. Gail me's due, but I, he came on the podcast after it and told his story. And it's fair play. Yeah, yeah. So Everybody's entitled to, to their views, Of Jim. course, and their voice. But I think he jumped on, on the bar. Anyway, it's done now. Yeah, of course. People move on and mm-hmm. there's no ill will. Tommy, go and do your thing. Mm-hmm. What was your, who was the maddest person you ever came across in your life in prison outside? Ah, there's a few. There's <laughs> <laughs> a few, aye. Is there? Some I can't even mention, mm-hmm. aye, but they're that fucking mad. But I'll give you one example. Uh, James McLean, uh, Denver, we never knew how severe his, his deterioration and his, and his, his mental health was good. Uh, we should have and it's a funny story this one but it's not something to be belittle on somebody with, that had a mental illness but we were asked to go and uh, collect some money off an individual who owned a whole chain of uh, aquariums selling tropical fish <laughs> if I believe it or not right? and some of these fish was like 1500 quid and different things like that and the whole rule of thumb was something like you get back and you catch somebody off guard and tell them what they're driving, where they stay, where they go. And it's just to unsettle them and they say, you owe this money. First of all, you go to establish that they own the money. Secondly, before you go anyway, you go to make sure they've got the money before you ask them. So James went uh, with one of our guys, another field agent. And when I got told the story when he came back, I thought, unbelievable. This guy's got the owner of the aquarium shop and he's told him where he lives what he's driving he's no moving James for the money he's denying not denying the money but he's just saying he's not going to it wasn't until, until James had interjected and said to him listen you you fucker if you don't get this money the fish are getting it <laughs> and the guy crumbled mm-hmm. and took the money out and fucking paid for it so there is a weak spot there he's more interested in his fish than than life and limb mm-hmm. So James was, uh, nearly was another one, nearly a, a famous one for breaking into somebody's car, uh, taking a spark plug and putting it right in a, a plastic bag full of petrol and taping it up. So when they jump into the car, and <laughs> I've seen when the bonnet of this car went about fucking 200 yards right into a crowd. Uh, there, there is a lot of strange people. Mm-hmm. Maybe one called one myself. But <laughs> it takes one to know I one. Don't know but what I say, <laughs> it takes one to know <laughs> one. But there is a lot. Uh, but again, these things happen. Right? People talk about serious and organised crime. The truth of it is, it is serious. But there's not a lot of organisation in it. Sometimes mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's the newspapers that jazz it up, and uh, it's probably the only time I'll probably agree with a, with a police statement. I think it was Mr. Warbler. Uh, Graham Pearson that said uh, there's no such thing as organised crime as disorganised he's right to an extent because you have certain elements there's certain groups of people that mm-hmm. are associated through geography where the areas where they come from mm-hmm. maybe football teams uh, and it's not like the mafia mafia series organised crime they penetrated the judicial system the banks and you know that was serious and organised crime mm-hmm. so import the words like, like, uh, Godfather, Gangmaster, fucking all the rest of it. It's just it's a play. Like beating up. Oh, well, it's it's to pad out a story for them. Mm-hmm. Makes it a bit more exciting. Mm-hmm. Your pals with Rab Carillers, mm-hmm. who was very well respected in Glasgow, Manchester, a boy for his streets, uh, and then went down and ran Manchester. How did that relationship you and? Well, I know his brother Jim uh, for Shorts Prison. And there was one occasion where Jim was going away to his villa in Spain and, and asked me if I, if I would go down and see Rob. Rob was wanting to meet me and I was wanting to meet Rob. Uh, and, and I did. I intended to go down for the weekend. And normally I had a, used to drink a couple of beers, maybe took a few lines of Charlie <laughs> if, you get, if you get too drunk. And what I remember about, about Rob's was he had this big goldfish fall and with rubber hoses coming at it. Like a bong. But they were, I, I, I thought it was crack that they're smoking on it. Turns out it's free base cocaine. Uh, tried it myself. 
and I stayed there for fucking three months. <laughs> it's a long, it's the longest, <laughs> longest time ever. But uh-huh. with Rab, I soon found out Rab had the biggest and best gun collection I've ever fucking seen. Uh, I can talk about it now. Rab, God rest him, is no longer here. And I want to address some of the situations because when he died, there was a lot of newspaper articles about good riddance to bad rubbish and unnecessary. He's got family. He's done his time. He's done, he done what he done. But the, the funny story, Rab is nuts. Rab is absolute crackers. And one of the things was he always liked Magnum Ices, ice creams. He had a heroin habit, cocaine habit. Uh, never ever bought drugs. He's always, he's always had them run about him. But that combination in the guns. There was one time where I was I was in his in his house and uh, he got one delivered, and he opened the box. He said, "What do you think of that one, Paul?" And I've looked at this nine millimeter silencer, subsonic ammunition, and, and his phone goes and he's got to go to the shops, right? So I'm sitting in the house going, "Ah, oh, fuck that!" Put the silencer on, put the rounds in the clip, got a phone directory, put it on the stairs, and went. Oh, you have it. That was annoying. And I thought, check the phone directory right through it. So I put yellow pages and a couple of books. I maybe done about three or four shots before Rav came in. And anybody that's fired a gun in a the house, they know they can smell the cord right? So Rav's going, What have you done? <laughs> I'm like, That's a bit of a fucking tool, that Rav. And I've showed them the, the, the phone directory, yellow pages, and the books. And he went, Where did you aim it? I went, On the stairs. The shock on his face, I thought, it's as though he pulled the gun out on him. And I, and I discovered that he had his lucky three-quarter lens trench coat leather one for the gang days in Postal uh, that he had in, under the stairs. And he took out those three shots through it. <laughs> <laughs> and he's going up his finger. Like, fucking, I've had that since 74. I'm uh-huh. fucking... Were you mad with it when you were shooting the gun? No, no, I was just... That was there. I should have been mad, right? <laughs> should have been mad, right? No, that was the rule, right? We didn't take it too often during the day mm-hmm. until maybe Friday, one o'clock. That mm-hmm. was... How hard is it, Paul, to see pals who you loved and adored and respected to see them deteriorating through drugs in the later life? Well, going back to the, the early prison sentences, uh, I don't know if I'd have been caught up in it, James. There's a good chance I would have been. Uh, but I missed it off for the young offenders. And when I came out, some of my friends had been on heroin, jellies, alcohol. Uh, they became untrustworthy. But I never noticed that. I still had them. They physically they changed. The weight loss and that voice that they've got, like sandpaper. Mm-hmm. So it just they became characterised. And we did try to help a few, but they didn't want to help themselves. They just got into so much of a rut that the help would have been there if it was needed. And what we always found is there's no point in giving them fucking money. So we used to take them out into the town, tracksuits, trainers. And then after a while, they fucking sell them, James. They'd get back up and take them off and just put them in the bag, keep the receipt in case. It's sad, it's mm-hmm. sad. But again, it's their choice, it's their life. Mm-hmm. How was it then coming out? And totally trying to go straight. Did you? Do you still feel as if you've got a magnifying glass on you? No. Paul? You, you, funny enough, when you're in uh, custody for a while, there's there's nothing changes in prison. It just prison's prison. Uh, your conditions might change, but environment out here and uh, different eras change. And I remember vividly the early eighties. Uh, the music at that time was like uh, Pink Floyd, Dire Straits. And then get picked up after the sentence in 1990. We nearly the bomb and his brother with this fucking music going boom, boom, boom. The speakers motor all fucking rattling. And I'm going, what the fuck is that? That's the new music. That's what it is. And then you end up in a private party. Blink was there. And he was the first guy that gave us uh, an ecstasy. <laughs> and, I, and I thought, is that drugs? Mm-hmm. I said, fuck, I ain't taking drugs. <laughs> ah, but it's a different kind of drug. So for the course of the night, I see people enjoying themselves and I think, you still got that? I said, he's half it up. As soon as I took half it, I'm tapping my feet and on it. And I'm saying, where's the other half? So that was my fucking uh-huh. introduction. Yeah, and then all of a sudden, it just took, took off it there. Mm-hmm. It's mad to think and see you 
puffing their own green man <laughs> you're, if I was to smoke a joint with you man I would be tri- I trip balls Aye. I'm tripping Aye. oh my mind goes overdrive no, I've had plenty of experience because I used to I used to experiment with uh, LSD but only mm-hmm. in confined I never took LSD going out but somebody had claimed that we took LSD in a nightclub fucking never happened in a nightclub uh-huh. no chance what about nightclub. ayahuasca Paul do you know what? I would be up for it, James. Because I've spoke about but you but coming to date with me. But it's the same thing again, James. It needs to be in a controlled environment. Because mm-hmm. I've, I've been on the wild child with Ald- Aldous Huxley, the <laughs> doors of perception. <laughs> uh, done a cut, I've, I replicated one of his experiments when I was in shots and I ended up with a big mural that I drew on the wall. It was like a caveman painting. Mm. That, it looked all right. Until <laughs> the next morning, I was like, what the <laughs> fuck is that? <laughs> Do you think you'd do it then? Uh, LSD, the, there's something in uh-huh. LSD that, that expands the mind. For the mind, I had to say that. Um, MDMA as well, Paul. And we speak quite frequently now over mm. the last year or two. And um, obviously I've got to get a bit of mere understanding about you. And we spoke about the ayahuasca. I think it'd be a fascinating thing. I, I would be up for it purely uh, as another experiment. I took drugs experimentally. Some, mm. uh, and I self-medicate, always self-medicate. Uh other people take their medication maybe too often or, and too much, but mm-hmm. it's it's like finding your level, but not to be dependent. Mm-hmm. But you always need that when you get to that edge, and everybody knows when they're getting to that edge, bang, where's the parachute? Because mm-hmm. you can't go through a lifetime of things I went through and no, uh, realise that you know, get, get fucking mental health issues. Everybody's got mental health issues. Just some have got them greater than others. Some people know how to put the brakes on mentally, some people don't. Mm-hmm. Uh, substance abuse, that's what I like to call it. It's not, it's, it's a word. Uh, I don't like having somebody that, that they want to call a smart kid or a coke kid or a fucking al You know, it's, it's derogatory words. Mm-hmm. You, you're putting people back into a box by saying that. So substance abuse, aye, it's all to do with different substances. Even the prescription drugs. You know, somebody might have prescription, an addiction to prescription drugs and alcohol. It's a whole wide diverse. And what I've found out with the younger crews is, because I talk to them and they talk to me because they know I'm no involved in authority. They know I'm, mm-hmm. I used to be one of them. And I, I discovered what a dunt is. And I, and I said to them, can you explain that to me again? Right. We take Mad Dog 50-50. We have a couple of joints, a couple of sleepers and a couple of offers. And maybe about a Charlie. I went, well, on and one go. Huh? What'd you do that for? Oh, it's some dunt. So that's what I done. Mm-hmm. They take it to the extremes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they're heavy. And the ecstasy. Fuck, sick. It's like a big catalogue. That's a cocktail of fucking oh. madness, <laughs> that, man. <coughs> but I think that's the problem where the younger ones, they don't really realise what they're taking. Mm-hmm. There's been a few deaths involved in it. And I think it's just a, they've took a risk and they've been ignorant. Mm-hmm. And I think maybe parents that don't know about substance abuse maybe want to learn. Mm-hmm. I'm hoping to get involved in some of the course material and doing that again. I'm mm-hmm. looking to get involved in youth justice purely on the basis that I want to be a Reg Mackay type figure that was there for the lost causes. But I'm not standing for any bullshit, James. If, if, if they people want to help themselves, then I, I'll help them until mm-hmm. they don't want to help themselves. Mm-hmm. And give them a, an incentive to go and do it. Aye. If I can do it, they can do it. I'm not different for Yeah, everybody needs a hand, but again, you've got to want that hand. You need to, to want to do it. The the, well, there's two key elements to it. First and foremost is you need to find out that they want to help themselves. Mm-hmm. That gives you that yeah. time. You're, you're no wasting your time. You're no bringing academics or professionals in that you're no wasting their time. And the other thing about it is, is to help them constructively explain it they might not be good at reading and writing the, the literacy and the numeracy might be affected as, as well as their communication skills so the second pillar of what we're trying to do is to form a respect contract between them and whoever comes in here no to swear no to go for your head no to, no to be violent towards them because these young guys are, and young women are, are volatile and you need a safe environment so if you're setting the standard for them do you want to help yourself? We'll help you. If if we help you, you need to respect us and the people that are coming in. Because mm-hmm. not everybody's from my life. 
style change but you've got professional counsellors academics yeah. other people want to help to change so there, there is an infrastructure there. definitely and there's so much related to addiction Paul whether it's trauma it's something it's you, triggered something there's so much more every, than every, having addiction if you look at the same elements of what we've all got we've all got DNA we've all got different fingerprints we've all got different voices uh-huh. so we've all got different problems okay one size didn't they fit all but you can re- reasonably turn around and say, well, there's an issue here, there's an issue of self-control and self-belief. A lot of people, when they, they take uh, whatever substance it is, they lose themselves. They forget who they are. And in reality, when it comes in and they try to stop, the worst thing probably people could do is go cold turkey and stop it. That's not the right thing. That's hardcore stuff. That's what you get in prison. Right into a prison cell, bang, door lock. You do more damage to them than anything else. So mm-hmm. there's a slow progression in which there's a need to ground them back to reality because there's an escapism for it. Mm-hmm. People don't like to see reality. They like to get drunk, they like to get stoned, they like to... And that's not just on a Friday and Saturday. No, it's, that's it just comes as a night then, doesn't that's, it? That's before they want to open the door. Mm-hmm. What do you think, that for when you grew up as a boy, for in the streets to where the young boys are now, do you think totally it's changed? Different, and it's probably... Totally different again, James. Who when my dad was there, it's it's evolving, and people say, "Ah, the young crews just now want to let the crews back in." They said the exact same about us when we were younger, mm-hmm. and the older crews were saying, ah, "It wasn't let us away back in the day." So how far do you take it back? You take it back on the basis of even see, we take it back fifty years. Look at the technology we you got right now doing this interview mm-hmm. to what they had then. The advancement of uh, social skills and interacting with people, conversation is gone. Too many. There's there's a lost generation with computer games. They're still f- mentally teenagers because they've no evolved their social skills because they're never at the fucking house. Mm-hmm. They're vampires. Yeah. I used to say to some of them during the day, well, just sat on your shoulder. What? Oh, smoke coming off you? What do you mean? <laughs> You're a vampire. Let's mm-hmm. see you at night. Mm-hmm. Fuck, see what you're up to. Oh, I'm fired up with this game. It's not that somebody switched it off. Mm-hmm. So there is a gaming addiction. There's a lot of people, the parents don't know how to handle it. Luckily, I had a gaming addiction. I used to play the kids' games first to, to make sure they weren't the broke. Mm-hmm. They'd be going, give us a shot, give us a shot. Mm-hmm. So I went through most of it. So I bring to the table life experiences. And other people who I'm trying to weave into the programme have got academic experience they've took the time and effort to go and get their accreditations through mm-hmm. universities and so hopefully there's a, a, a happy marriage for that one because I always give an example and ask somebody when would be the first time that they can recollect the country and what part they would remember for the country and normally it's usually the smell right you try and read a smell in a book you can't do it you can read the words about it, you can describe it, but you need to smell it. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing about life. You need to smell the reality before you can you can read them about mm-hmm. it. And so that's why I like doing, doing yeah. the books and doing it. When I do the interviews, Jim, it's, it's hopefully educational for other people. I'm no certain blown man Trump, but it's just one of these things where people are, are either going to like it or they don't like it. But I wouldn't want to waste an opportunity mm-hmm. that, that I think I've got. I've got young kids. Uh, and I hope that when they grow up they'll see me for what I'm on what I'm doing uh, and it's because I want to do it I'm not trying to look good I'm not trying to do nothing it's because mm-hmm. if, I, if I didn't like the passion I wouldn't do it mm-hmm. the same with your interviews James for anybody that's going through the struggle with a new Paul maybe in the jail with the jail just mm-hmm. coming out struggling with addictions maybe want to look at the life of crime and think I want to be a gangster what advice would you give for them? Uh, well they're going to end up spending the best part of their a lifetime in, in prison if they're lucky or they're going to end up dead or they're going to end up seeing their friends dead they're going to put their own family through the the, the, the mill uh, I've done it I know exactly what it is it's good when you get the money James but again you're going back to when you're sitting in the prison at your table and your family walk away for you it doesn't matter how much money you put in the table you can't buy that back Mm-hmm. And that hits you. So the longer you're away, your family deteriorate. It's a bit like somebody having a job four weeks off, four weeks on. The relationship becomes not so much toxic. It just 
the feelings get, get numb and for them they want to start out on a life of crime it's a choice that they've got to make and I'm not saying they're wrong in doing it and I'm not saying they're right in doing it because I've got no control over their thought process but what they should think about is the enhanced thinking skills is your aims, your goals and your objectives where you are right now and where you want to be in life and if people look beyond the hardships, that is difficult. People mm -hmm. automatically need funds to get their food, to pay your utility bills, fuel in the car. Everything's all, and responsibilities. Everybody's got that responsibility. Some go to greater than others. But I've got family members that have said to me, I'd rather just work for them. I'm happy the job that I'm doing. After a day, five days a week, sometimes a day, six days a week, I couldn't live the life that you've lived, mm -hmm. and I'd say the exact same to them. I couldn't do what you've <laughs> you've been doing. So it's a personal choice, and hopefully, when somebody says to you, "Don't get near that fire," you're going to burn your fingers, or you, or if you turn around having a conversation to it, you're going to have, you're going to burn your ass. <laughs> <laughs> right? So that's what crimes are for, mm -hmm. and people. And if you want to keep standing there and burn your ass, then some wrong with you. Mm -hmm. If you want to keep going to prison, which I done, revolving doors and all that, there must be something wrong. You're either no very good at it, which is a fact, or you're just being unlucky. But I don't. I, I wasn't. It was an occupational hazard. Yeah. I, my job was being a criminal. That's mm -hmm. what I was. That's what I gave up, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm going straight now. A lot of people say you're their uncle, cousin. Have you ever had any trouble people phoning you and no, saying? No, I don't. I don't mind it, James. And, and I'll draw a line at it. If somebody wants to use me. Uh, to get out of your situation or, or pre to prevent any violence. I, I'm cool with it. I don't bother mm -hmm. with it. But so you've got the green light, mate. No, no, no. Have half no, the nation. No, I don't agree. I, I don't, wouldn't agree with somebody using my name to force something on somebody, mm -hmm. become a bully on somebody. Then I would act on it. But, I mean, when I was growing up, people used to talk about Thompson. He was their great uncle and their, the dad they never had and all the rest of the nonsense. So... If it gives somebody a bit of comfort and it doesn't do any harm, I've not got a problem with it. How does it make you feel that so many people are so interested in your story and want to listen what you've got to say? How does that, for the boy that I you came for to what you're doing now? I don't really know the answer to that one, James. Does it feel strange? Uh, it, feels, it feels strange, aye. You, know? you get a bit uh, humbled with it as well. But there must be something there. It's not it's no me, it's a story. It's it's about events that I've done in my life and how you've come through it. Maybe people can, can relate to it. Uh, I'm not looking for any empathy. I'm not looking for any round of applause. It's just, it is what it is. Mm -hmm. So plans for the future then, Paul? Listen, for people watching, there will be a part three. The day we've just went on a different journey, which I've thoroughly enjoyed. I never knew that, James. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, as Uncle Paul back for part three. Um, <laughs> Going forward for the future now, Paul. Mm -hmm. um, you've done all your books, you've made your film. What's the plans for you? Are you going to get another book, another film, part uh, two? The, the book, uh, I liked writing books. Uh, it's 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 merely a, a therapeutic a for you. Uh, Reg called it the big fancy word, cathartic, you know, for mm -hmm. boys in the street that don't know. It, it means that you're doing all right for yourself. You feel a bit better getting it done in pen and paper. <clears throat> and that's what I didn't. I'm actually. I was asked to go on a scheme uh, that's getting piloted in some of the prisons. They're doing poems and literacy and writing about things. And I've asked to to kind of comment on some of the the the, the writing skills. Uh, that that's good, and, and I enjoyed doing that. It's I, I did it anyway. But there is young boys and young young girls in these sort of establishments that can't read and write. So the minute they're asked to write something, oh, they're into their, they revert into themselves. So there maybe there's more room for, if, give them an opportunity either through art uh, and, and recording. Because what I was interested in then was getting somebody to do their video diary for one of the programmes that I'm doing, no, the, the treatment programmes. So in the event that if somebody's looking at the success rate, don't believe us, don't look at the papers and, and do what we're doing. Here's a data stack. Go and look at the amount of people that's wanting to do their own interviews about themselves on a daily basis and if, how they feel that they can do it. So I'm currently working on visual projects. You know. uh, I've been asked to, to get involved in a, a few of them, but 
I went through a personal uh, challenge uh, just now with HMRC. It's liable to come out in some stage or another, so it might as well me mention it just now, and it wasn't nice getting threatened by anybody, especially government agencies like that. That could have went really uh, wrong for me and whoever was wanting to go and come and chop, chop the door. So uh, I'll leave that for another interview, James, and uh, anything else that can help with on, on that basis. We're looking at getting a, not so much a podcast on, on treatment, James. It's mm. today we're having a website available for somebody who's got an issue and can, can I guarantee them a response within three years. There's a guy that I'm working with just now called Mark Dempster. Another oh, big player. Mark, he's been on the podcast. Yeah, Good big guy. Brilliant, very funny. But mm. when people hear he's been an ex-addict, he knows he can smell the shit in the farm. Mm-hmm. He's got the finger on the pulse. So this is another academic that hopefully we're building things that we're going along. And uh, again, you guys do some the bit of work yourself mm-hmm. to bring alternative uh, entertainment like this. Because it is entertainment of for course. people. If it wasn't the entertainment, you wouldn't get the viewers mm-hmm. that you get. Aye. And it was only to thank you for, for your, your time and your hospitality. <laughs> again. Uh, oh, and likewise, Paul. And I never knew about the third interview, but I'll be looking forward nah, to that. We've got a, 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 there's so much we can touch on with you. The first one was more about your life, came through a lot of stuff, but I think people know about that now. Yep. Touched on prisons today, a few other wee topics, but the the part three I'd like today, and we'll touch on the future, your plans to making change, talking in prisons, making documentaries. Big Are you going near this ayahuasca treatment? I mean, you're going right on the ayahuasca. I, I, if you're up for it, I'll mm-hmm. consider it. Uh-huh. Just before we finish up, yep. last question, Paul. If the Paul at this day could speak to the Paul at 18 years old, what would they tell him? Quite a lot, but he wouldn't listen. Aye. That's fair enough, listen. mate. Aye. Quite a lot, but mm-hmm. he wouldn't listen. Mm-hmm. Hindsight's great, James, going back on it. You could talk to yourself with hindsight, but mm-hmm. the reality is, if I wasn't going to listen to my dad, I certainly wasn't going to listen to me, but there's elements where you can look back on it and say, aye, there's loads of things you could say to yourself back then. Would you listen as the problem? Because at that point, me identifying the threshold for treatment programs for people who want to help themselves first, mm-hmm. if they're not prepared to listen. Mm-hmm. And I know back then I wasn't fucking for listening. Yeah. And so, to get an honest opinion, I'd probably say a lot, but whether we get in one or the other, probably. Yeah, that's the thing about it. They don't listen. You know, he, 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 the thing about it there is, James, it's a great analogy that you put up, but I think a better analogy is. You've got to respect the source before you can accept the advice. Mm-hmm. And if you get somebody that you respect enough, you listen to them more than... It might not even be a family member. It might be somebody that... that, that the respect's got to be gained first, James. And, and depending on who's saying it, it might carry a bit more weight. Mm-hmm. So the, 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 the regression, going back to your childhood and saying, if only you'd done this, if only you'd done that, it's good to, to remember yourself how far you came forward. You've got the same issues of growing mm-hmm. up. I've got the same issues of growing up. You're into your your fiftieth, your half percentage of your life scale. Mm-hmm. I'm into my seventy five percent. And when people tend to look back and go, "Here's, a, here's one for you," no, for the younger ones because they can't look back ten years. Look back ten years, they might only be twelve, mm-hmm. might only be eleven. Mm-hmm. But for somebody who's thirty to look back to when you're twenty one, where did that ten years go, James? Fluent. It's fluent, mm-hmm. so you can look and you can guarantee uh, we, we all do respect that somebody's going to survive another 10 years and planning that forward leap is a, is a bit more an incentive. Don't waste your time, don't rush your time, things will happen mm-hmm. if you're prepared to do it. It's not going to happen that toss your coin or you wake up the next morning and wave a magic wand. Aye. Unfortunately, it doesn't work. Patience, in it? Patience, determination, rolling mm-hmm. your sleeves up taking the good with the bad and, and, and hopefully working it out, uh, especially under these circumstances that I understand isolation, understand the psychological issues that will cause. I've been in isolation myself, but in a different way altogether. Uh, but this is totally different for a, a lot of different reasons. And hopefully people can face up to the fact that everybody's got mental health issues. It's no, nothing to be ashamed of. Mm-hmm. It, but, but a lot of people tend to hold it in and they don't know who to talk to, they don't know what to do. This kind of brings it all out. Uh, the internet's good now for 
touching base. I've been on Twitter for quite a bit. I've actually quite liked that. Mm -hmm. You get a lot of direct messages asking, and I, I do the exact same. You know mm -hmm. what you're doing uh, and touching base with. So again, it's to do with figures. It's to do with the interest that people have got. And if you can maintain somebody's interest for the benefit, again, no blowing your own trumpet or mm -hmm. doing the big I am. Just telling it as it is, because there'll be somebody out there looking for that wee bit of nugget to go, hey, that's what I forgot about. Me, I'm going to try this. If you don't mm -hmm. try it, you never know. Exactly. And so. I think I think everybody has got an opportunity to build their own self-esteem back up. We've all had that with our ups and downs. Some people let it go too far and it's harder to get back up, but uh, everybody's got their own character and, and they'll do what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But they need to be shown certain things for other people's life without the finger-waving exercise and saying, you should do that. The minute you do that, people know that. Mm -hmm. So the determination for what you're doing, James, and the, the commitment you've got to... Entertaining people through your podcast mm -hmm. is brilliant and, and wish you well in the future. I, know, I really appreciate that and for giving me the time again yep. to come down and tell your story. You're doing me a turn as well. So, But people coming on, people listening, as my, just got to keep chipping away. Consistency is key. There's nobody in the UK works harder than me. Me and Nick here puts in a graph, so shout out to Nick, boy. Um, we're just working, mate. Consistency is key. I don't want to keep stopping my Paul because I know my demons are still there every fucking day. Everybody's so got them I need too. to keep churning them out and keep progressing because there's always someday people start podcasting and think it's easy. It ain't easy, and I'm glad they've started because then they'll know how hard I work. But I believe I'm already the biggest in the UK, thanks to guests like yourself. And I'm only going to get bigger and better and stronger. Oh, sure. My self belief, my confidence is second to none. It's untouchable. Well, you can't generate 20 million hits, James. And yeah, you can't. 25. But, 25. Uh, well, you've only <laughs> five on then. Oh, well, Plus, here's an extra five. We're talking over 30. So that oh, is what it is, mate. And again, Paul, for coming on today, brother, telling oh, your story. I can't wait for part three. We'll take it on a different journey. But thank you, brother. Pleasure, James. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.